Okay. Yeah. That's running live. It's not yet. It's setting it up. Oh, is it? Yeah. What's what is it like 10 seconds or something then? Yeah. We have a 20 second and here we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share copy. I can't believe how much we've learned. Flipping amazing. I know. We are amazing. Um, where did I put it? I heard an ice cream band then. I thought you'd put some music on. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to upload some things here. That's all right. All right. Oh my god, I'm missing a bit of charging. I think my dogs are going to talk to us today. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, they're very, very excited today. Oh, bless. <laughs>
I just tried to use my mouse for the my laptop. Oh, have you? I just was trying to, yes. <laughs> yeah, I've not I've not done that yet with mine. One thing at a time. So that's what the other thing I wanted to check is people aren't coming into our Zoom, but they're going to be posting questions only or they'll be on YouTube right. posting the questions. So that's what I have pulled up now. Okay. Um, but I'm going to come in as a, a viewer and not under us. scared to move because of all these wires. <laughs> Okay. Oh, that looks really good. I just want you to know we have uh, like five, five viewers right now. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that it, whether pink is the right one. So let's get a pencil. old-fashioned magic marker <laughs>
Okay. All right. Okay, just doing some volume shifts, but. <clears throat> How are we doing over there, Danielle? We're doing well and I'm, I'm ready to go. Let's get ready to rumble as they say. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so i might i might disappear during the podcast and become a puddle because it's uh extreme <laughs> temperatures over here so today. hot <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right i figure we would just kind of chat about what we're going to be doing for another few minutes and then yeah. we'll get this started give us enough time to get a people on logged in and ready to go that sounds like a good plan yeah just checking you can hear me okay I can hear you we're not having mic difficulties <laughs> so those who are listening Mel and I have this uh technical difficulty moment every podcast and it takes us a solid 20 minutes to get it back going but today yeah. it's all kind of working itself out also, thank you. So, <laughs> thank you so much for, uh, I, there was a URL problem when I was trying to get us going live with the C with what I had already done. So, um, thank you for that patience there. Oh, thank you, Casey. Okay, so Mel and I have been on a journey together. 
And this is going to be our very first webinar that is then going to lead us directly into a workshop that we would obviously love everybody to be a part of. However, Mel and I are just really excited to be at this point and having you guys share this with us because this is something that her and I never imagined <laughs> when we started this process and started moving forward with the podcast itself. And as our podcast grew, so did Mel and I's relationship and our friendship and our confidence. And we started to realize that we had some really good information that needed to be shared with other people. So as we walked this journey, we took notes and we're back with the notes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think sometimes you can have a vague idea of what you enjoy and what you want to do, but sometimes no comprehension as to what road that'll take. Yeah. None. That's, I guess it's the beauty of the journey is not knowing what's next. Yeah. Just yeah. kind of having an idea of where your next step is going to be and, and no clue where it's leading you. But as long as you're filling it up with good things, it can't be anything that's not fun. We've had yeah. our ups and downs in it, but for the most part, this has been a very exciting journey for the yeah. both of us. So, yeah. so with that being said, if you're ready to start, I think I'm ready to start. If not, Sounds we can good. wait for a few more minutes and just make sure, but that's kind of, I'll leave that one on you, Miss Mill. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I'm ready to rumble. <laughs> I'm ready to rumble too. I think we've been ready. <laughs> we've been ready. We've uh, we've been practicing. I um I, I think we when we first met, we thought about the idea of doing something together, didn't we? And yeah. uh, and then we thought about uh, possibly doing some podcasts, and we recorded quite a few discussions that we had. And back then there was no way we were going to fit on any of the Instagram reels because we were surpassing well over four hours <laughs> in terms of how those conversations were going. But we we started to realize we were we were capturing some really good stuff in, you know, when you connect with the right people, it's interesting what uh, what flows out of that. And that was around last March, I think. And when did we press live? Was it a year? this week that we went yeah. live in our podcast when we went to YouTube. Yeah, yeah. It was a year ago this past week. And so here we are, um, you know, one year into the YouTube game and, uh, we're doing our first webinar and I don't know if, if, you know, it's, it's hard to share that level of excitement because this is our personal journey, but guys, this is very exciting stuff for us. We, again, Mel and I had these big ideas and these big philosopher mindsets, and we were really ready to move forward. And then we came into contact in this serendipitous way. And it was like, that was it. We knew we met the person that we were meant to carry something further with, even if we didn't know what that something was. Yeah. And I think and that's, um, that's just one thing to note, isn't it? Is that you, you can try all things out with different people over the course of your, you know, life, whether that is work or hobbies or anything that you do with people, it doesn't mean to say that anything's failed. You've just learned the skills and applied it and learned some lessons in that and worked out what to do next. And then, then sometimes the right connection just comes along that's and right. you just put it out to the universe and it just happens. And I think that's what we really wanted to share to other people today, didn't we? It was all of these different ideas we've brought together that can help other people at whatever stage of their path that they're on. Absolutely. So this is where we are going to formally welcome you to Mel and Danielle's webinar. And we're bridging psychology and spirituality. We call this 101 because this is the level of where we're walking through the door and it we kind of don't have a lot of tools on our belt yet. And the world is still a little bit scary and a little wild for us. And we haven't been taught as psychology is rather new to the game in the grand scheme of society that a lot of these, these wonderful tools and tips out available to us isn't necessarily easily to easily reached, especially when you're not in the field of psychology or yeah. in the field of spirituality studying it. And so here we are just gathering this information and, and, and really holding dear to the things that worked for us 
and, and then, you know, passing that along to you, hoping that one of these things or multiple of these things can help you along your journey so that this community continues to grow because we, there, we want nothing more than a community that works together on a healing journey so that we can live our best life. Now, if the ideas don't seem relevant and you don't like what you hear, absolutely switch off. You, we're, we're just here to share information, but if this doesn't feel relevant to your journey, that's okay. There's plenty of other things out there that could be. Um, so if you are intrigued, we want you to, to know more and share this, this information with other people paying it forward. Most definitely. Yeah. So we're going to bring ideas, models, and experience of the last 20 of Mel's last 20 years, many that sit within the field of psychology, spirituality, and esoteric practices. Uh, we're going to do, we're going to go over research, psychological training, quantum theory, movies like the secret, um, personal and professional development and mental health and well-being realms. So as you can see, we're, we've got our fingers in a lot of things. <laughs> So our aim today is to share some of these to help you to start your journey. We're going to develop your awareness, meaning ignorance is not bliss. Learn about some of the theories of the mind, body, and spirit. Learn some tools to get you started or help you further along on your journey. Help you easily find people who are also masters in their field that has a wealth of free information that can help you too. Mel and I are passionate about working as a whole community, and that includes helping you reduce the time wasted listening to the noise and going down dead end alleyways, as well as your intuition to help you fill in what's right for you. So now we're going to kind of go over our agenda and our framework. And I think that Mel is the one that's going to be able to give that information the best. Thanks, Danielle. Um, and I think the key point that you made right at the beginning is bridging psychology and spirituality. The two don't always go hand in hand. And um, a lot of these psychological concepts are things that people might um, learn when they go into therapy. And um, as we've said on many other podcasts, therapy, coaching services, healing services, whatever it is that you feel drawn to do is important. However, we wanted to make a lot of the information that we've used ourselves or used with our clients really accessible um, because sometimes you can go online and some of the things that we'll show you later on, um, I'd, you, you can read about it and you can have a sort of vague understanding of it. And sometimes you need a little bit help as to how to use that in your day to day life. So, yeah, it's definitely 20 years of a whole range of and, and things have uh, changed exponentially in the last five. So uh, in terms of the webinar, you know, some of that might include uh, some of some of our stories, uh, people who come on the journey with us, their stories and the concepts that can be used individually. So what we're talking about is really tuning in as to understanding where you're at. And we'll have a look at how you work that out um, in a better way in terms of where you are in your life, your feelings, your thoughts, your experiences, your relationships, and just get into the essence in terms of what we're doing. And then just choose what um, out of all the information we share, like most trainings and workshops, people tend to just take two or three things away with them. So if something resonates, write that down. And uh, if you've got a journal that you can use, um, cause of course we're going to make this a recording so you can always play that back. Um, but having a journal, um, I think they found in recent research that actually writing things down helps that process of bringing through information that's in the unconscious mind and, uh, connecting with that. So, um, there's a lot of people that Danielle and I have really inspired us and we really want to pay homage to those, uh, that have been part of our journey. And we're going to go and, uh, have a look at that. But the other aspects of this is it's really key about who surrounds you. So who are your mentors, your peer support? Who are the people that have got your back, that will listen to you? 
um, on a day to day level, but also maybe that might mean joining a mentor group, a peer support group. And if there's people that are living a life in the way that you like and something that you learn when you do NLP training is you want to know how they do that. You want to know kind of what thought processes, what ideas. And I think Lewis Howell's podcast, he goes into that really well. He really finds out deeply about people, what's uh, inspired them and motivate motivating them. So this is to help you love yourself, your life, and make more changes, transitions necessary uh, for transformation. However, if you're okay where you're at, that's perfectly okay too, because sometimes we need to just accept that where we are is okay. We don't have to strive, because some of us um, can continually strive, continually learn, continually pack our minds full of things and think we have to have a constant goal list but life is about balance so if you're veering too much on the other side of that activity and constantly got a focus just as I do and Danielle does we have to have days where we just switch everything off quieten everything down and not engage in any material because your body needs time to take in information process integrate and then allow yourself your system to come up with um, the inspiration for the next step and some of the tools that we're going to go through will help you shift either the external noise and that can be people's chatter what's on the news or environmental noise and tune into uh, being able to be aware of what some of that information is Uh, because we're getting inspiration and ideas all the time but sometimes the noise is just too loud and we can't access that so uh you know in terms of how we got here then um Danielle you know it'd be really interesting to understand a bit about your journey oh yeah so um with my journey I would like to say that I really focus on the journey portion of this and not what led me to this journey, but I will say that I had, um, I was, I had to go back to the core of my being, what we in the spiritual community would call the root chakra or the root of where everything started. I had core values that, because of the trauma that I had experienced at a youthful, at a young age. So they say trauma, you know, up till seven is a core value. And, um, I had to go back into those core areas and start to heal the places for myself that were really pushing me into a survival mode and not into this beautiful, gratifying thrive mode. So I really took the time to go as deep as I possibly could and heal the spaces that were not reflecting what I was inspired to be as Mel had mentioned, you know, start to look up to the people that really inspire you and get to figuring them out. And you're going to start to see their daily habits, their consistencies that really will bring something out of you that forces you to look in the mirror, walk through that fire Mm -hmm. and come forward So during that process, I realized that I was gifted with a lot of information. All of the research I had done gifted me with a lot of wisdom. And the fact that I walked my talk and I went through these things on a personal journey level, that this wisdom needed to be shared. And so now I move forward from this learning, which I'm always a student of the universe, but now I'm also in the the position to be able to teach what it is that I I've learned Mm -hmm. and to share this information with everybody, because we all deserve to live and thrive and get out of this survival mindset that we've been conditioned to believe is the norm. Mm -hmm. There's something really beautiful about what is progressing inside of me that I would love to turn around and see that reflection in everybody I look at. So that's kind of what led me to this place and, and this workshop and this webinar that we're working towards. What about you, Mel? Um, so, you know, as you know, I live in the UK and I grew up in Manchester and Manchester is a Northern town. And in the seventies, we had the overhang of the kind of industry that um, was prevalent in society at the time. Um, so it was mining, industrialised, uh, you know, uh, the, the cotton mills and the, the ideas of who you could be 
uh, and in particular being a woman back then in that society, were really quite narrow. And I remember kind of looking around and seeing the different lives that people had. And it's not about judging where what people have got and who they are, but the class system was quite strong back then. The, the, the divides were uh, much more, uh, uh, you know, uh, clear. Um, and so what people thought you could aspire to, in particular in school, you know, what they thought that you were going to lead to, um, wasn't necessarily what you wanted. But we weren't, you know, if you come from a background where there's very little money, you're not really shown other opportunities or experience of the lifestyles. And um, it's really difficult to know what else is out there. But some of us just have this knowing. And I remember thinking I didn't want that. And yet, because schools' attitudes about what you can do and can't do can sometimes be quite negative and you don't get uh, you don't get people looking at you as though uh, you're someone who can aspire in life. Um, it was something that I just decided, you know, to leave one day. And then several years later, you know, was married, had, had some children and decided to get on the path and try a course. And the moment that I started learning and realised... It was a subject that I found fascinating and many of the theories and models that exist within society, whether we're talking about Jung and Freud and, um, you know, ideas that came from the 60s about the human uh, potential movement, because all that was was quite new as well. And the transitions that women were making in society, you know, lives were very different for our moms. We've said that on other podcasts, haven't we, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, um, that. I didn't really know what was possible, but I started to get an inkling that what I was starting to uh, learn was something that was really uh, drawing me towards it. And over time, really, it was, you know, once I started, you know, as you know, my background is a was a psychotherapist. And one, once I started to work with people, I went back into schools and I started to see the same thing. 20 years on, children who, you know, were either given aspirations at well below their intelligence level. And I don't care what class you're from. You know, we've got smart kids in, in all aspects of society that weren't, um, you know, weren't supported to thrive. Right. So that's kind of how it started and why some of these models have uh, fascinated me. Uh, but I think it's it's always about empowerment. And, you know, I am a female and for a long time working in the industries back then prior to this work, I worked as a chef and uh, working in very male dominated in- industries in the 80s was a very different world from the world that we're in now. You know, we've still got a lot of headway to make. Yeah. And so it's about empowerment, you know, and I think that's what's continued to work for me uh, and be important to me all along. Yeah. And I love that. I love your story. You have such a brilliant story of, you know, everything facing towards you and you're being able to walk through that anyway. It's, it's inspiring. Thank you. So, you know, I think what Mel's really trying to say is you don't have to live the life that you once had or the life that they've told you, you need to have. Um, you know, you, you get to be the person you choose to be society has this normalcy and this normalcy is actually quite crazy for a lot of us. And so we're developing a new normalcy as a society. And because of that, we're able to bring forward new ideas, um, bridging gaps between things like psychology and spirituality are now available to us. Um, Life is now able to tap into your resources, your gifts and skills to create a life that takes you out of survival and into this thrive mode. So some of the things that I would like to, and I know Mel's mentioned this already, but if now is the opportunity to grab a pen and paper, if you have a journal, I would recommend a journal. That way you can keep all of your notes together. But some tools that have really helped a lot of people along this journey of healing and recuperation and moving into thrive is very simple and basic tools, pens, journals, paints, um, being creative in whatever way it is, you know, for me, my art artistry was photography for a long time. And I was able to express what I was feeling in here inside my heart into what I do as an art form. And then my art form has over the years kind of changed into more of the speaking art. And so, Mm. you know, find, tap into your creative side, be it music, be it art of, you know, like, um, you know, drawing, 
you know, computer graphics, getting on and, and, you know, some of the ways that I've learned to journal is by recording myself so that I can hear myself back. You know, there's not a wrong way to do this. Um, so some of the key areas that if you focus on developing that will get you pretty quick results are going to be some of the things that we're going to go over today. So until you change the programming, nothing is going to change. And that is a quote from Bob Proctor, who is quite wise as well. And one of the masters of the field. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and type that in there. I'm going to be typing as we go into this. So if there is one of these amazing masters of their field that you find interesting, you now have yet another line towards a tool that can help you succeed in this world. Yeah. So, and there was the, sorry, just to uh, yeah. interrupt a moment. Um, there was a really good interview with Lewis Howells recently and Bob Proctor. So if you look up Lewis Howells, um, I think it's H O W E L S. Um, but brilliant. And oh, this I, man I misspelled is... that on here. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just put how. <laughs> But if people want to email us, if any links stand out, but I think if you, even if you sort of slightly misspell it in uh, YouTube, it comes up, doesn't it? Yeah. It'll still pop up on, on yeah. the good old um, search engine. So we have a couple of key areas that we're going to be focusing in and that's your mind, body, and spirit. We, I, you know, I prescribed, uh, subscribe to this three heart theory, the mind, the mind, the body, your stomach, brain, and your spirit, which is your heart and how we need to align the three of those in order to work through any survival mechanisms that have been programmed in us. And we can move forward into those thrive responses that we truly deserve. Um, so at this stage, let's just state one line. Um, uh, so Ah, let's go. I'm sorry. I just lost my, my place. I have notes written because I don't want to miss anything. Um, so let's look at our perception. So perception in this world gets a little confusing because we are taught to continue the same perception as everything, as everybody else. Think of news the news, think of politics, think of social media, think of what is the most popular on YouTube channels and other TikTok or other social platforms that bring us forward. We all have this solid perception of certain things. What we need to do is come in, knock that perception completely off its feet and start really taking a look at how we are perceiving things and not the mimic of another per person's perception. Um, we need to work on intuition. This would be another one. And so intuition kind of works like, this is a really great time to introduce the gene keys or human design because our intuition is part of what I call a blueprint. I think psychology even uses blueprint, right? The, the blueprint of who you are. So when you are going tapping into your intuition and say you go to human design and look up what your, what your modality is inside of human design, you're going to quickly figure out that you have a very clear set of intuition. Mine is splenic, meaning I get an immediate yes or no. It's not a gut punch. It's not a, a verbalization inside of me. It's literally just yes or no. And that's how my intuition works. Now, Mel's intuition works is something that kind of speaks to her in a uh-huh mm -hmm. or nah uh <laughs> kind of way, right? And it's wild because this actually is very simple. It's your body's attunement to its most basic need of your intuition can simply be something that just as you quiet your mind and you take the breath, you can hear what your body is telling you and your body. And the first level is the best way to walk into intuition, tuning into self, tuning into the body, researching what you need to know. Again, human design will really help you in figuring out how your intuitive body works for you. And I'll go ahead and type that as well. And, um, once you figure that part out, you're going to start tuning into that and saying, Oh, this makes sense. So the mind, so 
I would like for Mel to kind of give us a visualization of how we work in the mind and, and the way you can make your mind work for you. So um, I think the basic sort of element of the mind really, and it's coming through pretty much everyone, everyone in the field that are talking about this is um, noticing what you think, because what you think will have an impact on what you feel, and then it will have an impact on the behavior. Um, if you're a visual person, and not everybody is, it may be that you're drawing up images to do with what you think. And then what happens in that process, and we'll talk um, a little bit more later about um, how we need to understand stress and the impact that that has on us, but that will then uh, elicit the stress response in the body. And it is a matter of milliseconds. So harnessing the mind and the mind not controlling you is probably one of the biggest tools. And that's why things like mindfulness and meditation have really become a the phenomena that it is. It's not necessary uh, to sit for two hours on top of a mountain, umming all day. And of course I practice meditation, but for that reason is your mind can run riot and all sorts of things can happen in your mind that you can end up going down a particular track. And before you realize it, you've wound yourself right up or you've entered into lots of arguments. On the other side of the page, um, you can harness your mind and use it in really wonderful ways. And that's yeah. what we're going to focus on today, because once you start to, it, what, one of the sort of metaphors I've, I've given clients that I've worked with is sometimes the mind is like Velcro for negative experiences and thoughts. And sometimes it's like a frying pan that's got um, a nonstick, you know, it, and it'll just slide off so what you want is the thing that's negative that's not yours that belongs to somebody else to slide off and what you want to stick are the positive experiences and the ideas that actually support you in your life and your development but often it's the other way around and that's because it, it's not just an individual thing but it's a society thing and it's what we learn at school and all those experiences you have before seven so part of becoming into adult life is learning to um really understand how how your mind is working what influences that and how you operate on a day-to-day -day basis and that depends on the level of awareness you've already got. Some people have got really good awareness and some people are developing that. And that's linked with the cycle of change as well. And I'll go into that a bit more deeper uh, in part two. You know, I think one of the favorite things I ever watched was a guy that was talking about specifically our mind and fear and how we are, yeah. you know, survival level attuned to this fear. Because think about it. Think about the Neanderthals. They yeah. would come out. And their first thought wasn't going to be stretching <laughs> and saying, what a glorious morning. Do you hear the birds chirping? Can you yeah. see how beautiful the sun is? It's, is there a saber toothed tiger that's going to eat me? Do I, I need yeah. to take a look around for giant snakes? You know, maybe somebody's coming in to, to still all of the, the, the harvest that I've been collecting over the year. So we really are ingrained the on primed. a very deep, yes. On a very yeah. deep survival level to automatically go to fear. And this is why we ask for the patients in the time to acclimate through the fear so yeah. that you can get to the thrive response so that that thrive response, that neural pathway begins to develop so that when you wake up in the morning, you get to stretch and say, whoa, how beautiful is the sunrise this morning? Can you hear the birds chirping and not, oh my God, I might get fired today. What if I'm out of gas? What if my child acts out? So, you know, although we've come a long ways from saber tooth tigers, we, we still are that. very much programmed for that survival response. And in a way, because that, you know, the, the mind and the brain's job is to keep you safe. So humans are meant to evolve. Yeah. And one of those ways is, as you say, it's not the saber tooth tiger now. It's the freeway that you're driving down or the, the shops that you go in when it's really busy or, you know, the unsafe areas. So the, the brain's scanning that information all the time. And we're taking in millions of pieces of information <clears throat> all day, every day. And what will happen is, the amygdala, which is the base part of the brain, will get fired up. But mm -hmm. some people's amygdala is more active and uh, continuously firing up because of those early experiences. Yep. So it's not wrong that the brain does that because actually what that does is the whole system 
can operate in the way that it needs to if we don't interfere yep. in it. But when we've oversaturated ourselves with either our internal processes or the external experiences we've had that have made that amygdala fire off, because you get the amygdala firing off and then you get the hippocampus that stores the memory. Yep. And, the, and the hippocampus is like the security guard that comes up and goes, look, this is why you should be worried. This is why you should be fearful. Yeah. And so the security guard's just trying to keep you safe. But what happens, and that's why we're uh, talking about breaking free from your past, yeah. is that's the programming. Yeah. No. And that, you know, the, the more that the researching, you know, I've, I've noticed that there's some studies going on about even children in the womb and the level of stress that the, yes. the parents were under, you know, I know this fantastic woman who, while she was in vitro in her mother's womb, there was, um, war and, and some famine and real concern about the basic yeah. survival needs from the, the person carrying this child. And so you can't help but think that even inside the womb, you really are starting to be programmed for yeah. certain stress levels, how you react to them. And at, which makes it even more important that we allow this integration process to really come through and really sit inside, you know, I'm going to keep saying sit inside the fire until we walk out to the other side so that we can get into that thrive response. We have mm -hmm. to face that fear and really just let it permeate until we can walk through it because on that other side of fear really is your truth is the thrive response that you've been asking and begging for. So, um, so one of the key things just as a sort of starting note is everyone um, has similar mechanisms, but our brains aren't necessarily the same. And that's what we find in now with neurodiversity, that we're all on a spectrum uh, in different ways of how we manage life. But it's, it's been able to sit down and go, you know, am I getting into arguments with everybody? Am I falling out with my boss? Am I having problems everywhere? Because if your life looks like that, then it's telling you that the programming that you've applied needs a bit of a reboot. You know, we need to go from Windows 6 and bring it up to the, <laughs> the modern aspect. Yeah. Now, on a computer, that's fairly simple because we just reload it or we buy a new laptop. Um, but as a human, you know, uh, sim it's, it's sort of simple in practice and sometimes so simple it, it looks unreal. Yes. However, we're also complex beings that complicate matters. And, yeah. um, but that's the sort of key thing is where is, uh, you know, where is your life working? And, and are you ha having these issues? And we're using words like trigger much more now. And yeah. so, you know, if you're getting triggered, well, but that is the, you know, the amygdala firing off, but you can have the amygdala firing off when you lay on your bed and nothing's going on. And that's the thing. And that's where the mind comes into this is how how are we utilizing a really important part of our system because the mind body and soul and spirit are totally interlinked so yes. you know and, and I've got, yeah well yeah the mind is really the first thing we have to tackle we are not a slave to the mind the mind yes. is working for us and i think that is a key component to what we need to truly truly understand is that we are easily the slave to the mind yes. that the ego is a guardian yeah. and that guardian is here to protect you. But sometimes we can be protected. I, you know, what is it? The, the girl with the long hair, Rapu uh, is it Rapunzel? Rapunzel. Yeah. yeah. You know, like she put her, like she, we thought she was protected, but what was actually happening she was missing out on her life. Yes. And so, you know, we really need to get in the front of our brain and, and really make it work for us as opposed to just being the slave to the master that is the brain, i.e. ego or guardian, as I prefer to call it. Yeah, exactly. And that is the starting point for a lot of people is, mm -hmm. is part of that review process, which is why when we do the workshop, it's in two parts. Because first of all, you've got to give time to look at where were you before today? What was going on? You know, what's worked? And, and again, I'll go through that timeline process uh, in the next hour. Um, and then then you think about where are you going? Because the two are, you know, we're not linear and, and lots of people say, you know, time doesn't really exist. Everything right. is in the now. So everything is, you know, so we need to sometimes pull that out and have a look at those aspects. So we can take from that a bit like, um, 
uh, past life work and shamanic work, we, we can take from those experiences and those resources and bring that forward. And then we need to clear what's not been on, that's not been helpful, or we perceive as having a detrimental effect on us. Um, and they can be a whole range of experiences. People listening will know what those experiences are for them, but you can loosen the, uh, you can loosen the Velcro as you start to move forward. Yeah. And your first point about perception, you know, a shift, a big shift in perce- perception can literally change your life. It did um, mine. Yes. Yeah. Perception yeah. will change your life. It will change. That's one of my favorite games to play with people is the, you know, what if we looked at it from this angle? Yes. You know? And once they can kind of open that guardian, you know, it's kind of like a bypass to the guardian or the ego mind. It, what you're doing is a- allowing some something to be created that your mind would not be able to see otherwise. And once that perception has been able to be created outside of the perception, you know, you then allow space for things to enter into it. And now the guardian, the ego mind isn't as afraid to allow the space to be created. And this is really kind of in a esoteric way, the way neural pathways work, you know, is that we're allowing that branching to happen or that diversion or that new highway to be created. Yeah. I think that's a really key point is sometimes people rush the process. Um, and if your ego is too stressed, you know, it's, it's going to put in big roadblocks. Um, so sometimes it's about stepping back, taking your foot off the gas and letting Mm. each step occur because the will, um, and again, it's not the same for everybody, but there will be a time when you let go. Um, and I remember reading, is I think it's Michael Slinger, Singer, Slinger, his book, 2019. Um, and I never really understood the word surrender, but the, the sort of concept started to make more sense as time went on about really being able to let go and just li- let life work. It doesn't mean stay in bed all day, you know, but it, there's a sort of something quite it's a grace about it and that means then the ego won't keep coming in and and trying to force itself or come up with all these different things as to why you should and shouldn't right and that's exactly what that is you know and i i will say that new age spirituality has done some damage for ego work we are not meant to get rid of our ego our ego truly is our guardian And what we have to do is instead switch the roles of the guardian. The guardian is here to protect you, not tell you what to do. And we are at the end of the day, sovereign beings, which is free beings. We have that choice. And so we have to be stronger than the guardian. We have to be stronger than that mental lack of clarity that we're so used to having. How does the memory play into? Um, I'm not, I think when it comes to memory in the mind, my uh, favorite uh, researcher is um, Andrew Huberman. However, um, in NLP and hypnosis, what they're talking about is that the the memory is the hippocampus and, you know, you have short and long-term memory. And often um, you can have experiences um, and this is why they, they know that if a child is in a really good resourceful state, they tend to learn because certain experiences get attacked with emotion. And so um, the, those, those imprints are stored there. Mm-hmm. Now, in, in some terms, the metaphor is almost like a filing cabinet where you put files in a particular place and people who are using coping mechanisms might have a drawer that says, I'll look at that in 10 years and another drawer that says, I can look at that tomorrow. I know when I start to get um, stressed or I'm really busy, I start to write more lists because I I don't retain it in the same way. But that's how I uh, understand memory. It's not my specialist area. um, But when you link up the processes in terms of what images come forward from the security guard when the amygdala is fired off and your system is going, what step next? then the memory, the hippocampus plays a really big role. Because one of the examples I used to give to people is, you know, do you get upset with your living room table or do you get upset with the sofa? Well, you see it every day. It's in your memory. You have some association with it, but it just doesn't have the same potency as some of the memories. So that's why it's really important that when we have experiences to create 
more memories or create more good experiences because we've had negative experience. I don't know how true it is, but they say something like 12 positive statements for every negative statement made. Well, it depends on the person and that's how, right. how you know, empathy plays a part in this. Um, highly empathic people can take those things on and carry those much more than people who are um, less empathic and the, the impact can be less, but it's... Uh, it's an evolving area. I think we're very early on in in brain research. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Um, so programming definitely plays, and I, I mentioned this earlier, but programming definitely plays a solid connection. Massive. Yeah. Massive connection to how we perceive life, how <laughs> we move forward with life, how we allow our intuition to sit on the sideline because another person has decided that their information is the correct information. Yeah. And, you know, we, we've talked about this and anybody that explores uh, society is if somebody wants to understand how we ended up thinking and feeling and believing a lot of the things we do, because a lot of that actually isn't ours. If you think about why is it I think what I do, you'll normally take that back to somebody in the family that shared that with you or a TV program that you watched. And TV itself is a programming mechanism. If you want to go right back into society and have a look at how uh, this started, well, it was Freud's nephew who went to America and worked with all the ad companies, you know, that started the whole um, capitalist culture of getting everybody to buy stuff. So they yep. use behavioral psychology to do that. So understanding the programs and where that information's come from is really uh, empowering and really freeing because then you'll start to realize, well, why do I believe that? Where did that come from? Well, that was from such and such. And was that accurate? Right. Because there's a hell of a lot of people around us that tell us nonsense. All the time. <laughs> All the time. Yeah. And and the beauty of it is, is they just use key words, key phrases. And, you know, what we, yeah. you know, what we're calling spirituality and psychology 101 is, is the base, the 101 of manipulation. Yeah. So, you know, highly recommend that when you're going through this process to stay off the news until you learn a little deeper amounts of discernment to stay away for advertising, advertising, you know, get on streaming services instead of advertising cable networks, allow yourself to change the algorithm on social media platforms to where you're seeing positive things that are more towards the benefit of your psyche and not towards the detriment of your psyche. You yeah. know, um, the best thing I ever did for myself was get out of, um, politics. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's not that politics could, could be a great, it could be a great thing, but mm. right now as a society, we're still growing and still learning and it's just not a great place to be. The skills are still tipping, um, in the side that we don't want it to be on until we balance it back out. So in the meantime, while you're on this healing journey, just keep yourself in check on what information you're receiving or allowing to come in, because this really is programming you at a subconscious level. We're not anti- these things yeah. were just simply saying that if you are serious about your healing journey, some of the first steps you can take is to, to not be constantly allowing this type of programming in your face so that you can come down to what, like Mel said, is this really how I feel? Or is this how I've been told to feel? Well, it's discernment, isn't it? And if, yeah. if you're going to, if you're going to lamb blast yourself with noise 24 seven, or although, you know, people at least will have six or seven hours sleep. It's really about um, what you're uh, allowing yourself to experience because on a very sort of level, you know, if you start to watch a thriller, you know, a movie yeah. and the music starts to play, yep. on a very subtle level, frequency that's played through these different um, programs that are on the TV and the news will arouse the uh, stress nervous system. So all day we're getting our nervous system aroused through events and activities that actually are nothing to do with us. We've got enough with living our lives and looking after our families and children and everything else. So it's part of that becoming more discerning and having a look at what is probably influencing you. Yeah. I rarely have my TV on now and it's opened up because I decided if I'm going to spend five hours a night watching TV, I, I could actually spend five hours a night doing some photography or reading up on other stuff that I'm interested 
invested in right. and allow that time to open up. But again, it's discerning what um, what's influencing you yeah. because the two environments and human are in constant interaction. Absolutely. And we're in a yeah. dual world. And I, it's and yeah. as Mel said, guys, believe it or not, things are so simple. It's our complex mind that creates the complexity. Yes. So if you were to simply just feed this, this, I've I kind of lost what I was saying, but this, the inside of this duality, as long as you continue to feed a positive nature and allow that to hit those subtle energies, you're really going to see that it's a basic combo fear or love. It really yeah. goes down to that. It's that simple. Does it feel like love? Then I can move forward. Does it yeah. feel like fear? Then I need to put up my discernment and really start paying attention to what is creating that fear based in, uh, emotion inside of me. And it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's a basic step, but it really does get you back in tune with your intuition, your discernment and your journey to, to thrive. So on the other side of that, watch comedy. You know, yeah. Yeah. just immerse yourself in, in things that make you laugh. And laughter is definitely one of the biggest healing mechanisms we've got. Yes. And if you're with people that make you laugh and you've got your buddies that you go for a drink with and your girls that you hang out with, laughing and sharing things that were funny and stories is amazing. So, yeah, don't you don't do this. You don't have to sit on the mountain on your own forever. If you if you feel the compulsion to do that, then do that. But the, you can just swap over. So in programs like, you know, 30 Days to Change Your Life, all you're doing is you swap in programs for new programs. You don't necessarily focus on getting rid of one. You just make that less in your life and you start to increase uh, the other things that are going to be positive for you. That's right. And then final on these basic key events is identity. Mm. How do we identify ourselves? How much should you identify yourself? You know, um, a lot of us understand religion and religion has this statement is specifically in Christianity, Christianity, which is I am. And I am has been taken and moved into spirituality because the basis of it is spiritual. So when you state I am, then you are everything and you are nothing all at once. Yeah. But in society, in our personal journey, we do have to identify with a few things. And, you know, Mel, I think describes this best. Well, it's the classic when you go to a party, isn't it? Who are you? What do you do? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I've struggled with both all my life because I've, you know, had several roles. And uh, anyone who knows if they work as a doctor or a solicitor are going to get people who say, you know, well, I've got a problem with my foot. You know what it is, you know, in the middle of the part in solicitors the same. If you're the therapist, you know, so it's like, uh, are you, you know, are you a mother? Are you a daughter, a sister, a brother? Who are you? Because we're, these are roles that we uh live out and there's no good or bad to it but it's not in essence who we are they're just uh, roles that have been created by society and um you know how signed up to that role are you and what do, what does that mean to you if you really want to get deep into sort of the identity politics then we're exploring race gender culture um class and all the systems because the language around this has been created by governments for eons uh, for all sorts of reasons. And the way that we describe and define ourselves is a con uh, constantly changing process. Um, so the way that I would describe myself growing up may, may well have been different from my peers and um, because it depends on what language is available in your family and it depends on um you know the, the system that you're in so however you choose to define yourself is up to you that's none of my business however it's understanding that everything has its limitations and its and its advantages um and so if you describe yourself with national identity or as a sister, or as a brother or whatever. So it's just, again, going into self and we are self and everything else on top of that is the construct that we uh, create for ourselves. And anyone who knows that they feel they haven't fit in society for any particular reason, this is often at 
underlying some of the difficulties they have. Um, so I used to work, just as an example, I used to work with a lot of families where they had children who were, and I'm talking about UK language now, mixed heritage, multi-heritage, mixed race. And it was really about exploring those different aspects of those cultures of those families coming together and how they redefine themselves. And many families who have gone through that process find a way of narrating their own story because they weren't going to fit in any one system or culture or way of being um, in the same way again, because that's what it forces to do when we when we change, uh, shift and grow. So, um, but that's a whole different podcast when we look at um, identities and who do we see we are. But some of the questions I used to do with um, therapists when I was running workshops would be, you know, who are you? How do you describe yourself? Uh, where does where did the messages about who you are come from? What kind of things did you hear as a child? You know, I'm a rich, poor. Am I this? Am I that? And how do you define other people? And, and because we are always in relation to other people. So when we're growing up, it's in relationship to were those identities strengthening or did you have an identity that society saw as a negative thing? And then you can start to unravel how you feel about those things and whether or not uh, that is something to reflect on. I know when I did the work um, years ago on this, I spent a long time diving into this as a, as a subject area in my research. Um, I went through my own personal journey of really examining the messages that I received about being a woman, being a multi-herited white woman, because we talk about political language and personal language as well. Right. Um, and that is actually a more natural journey than people realise. Um, it's became, it's It's got some ground now because it's become at the forefront in society around gender and sexuality. Um, but that has been a journey that a lot of people have taken and a very personal one, um, because sometimes that involves going on a journey and meeting members of the family from the past and all of that. So but that is another uh, workshop. But it's just worth having to think about if that is standing out to anybody at the stages of psychology and spirituality 101. So we are. Um, oh, OK. So in terms of. Um, in terms, in terms of really starting to understand the process about yourself, it depends on where you are on that journey. Um, so as Danielle uh, said earlier, some of the tools that we've both used that I really like uh, are the human design and the gene keys, but any kind of psychological uh, mapping or spiritual mapping that is available that you're drawn to, that gives you the capacity to understand yourself in a deeper way. And then you tune into, yeah, that fits or no, that doesn't fit or oh, I noticed myself doing that and actually this is really benefiting me more than I realised. Um, and that's what it'll do. And sometimes you need to dig deeper and think about your own beliefs, your values and the traits because beliefs and values is where we can get uh, tripped up. And uh, if you go online and you can put in uh, a search for uh, a values uh, exercise, sometimes what you can do is just, uh, I think, there's usually about 80 different words, all different values. And you just score what's the most important, what's important and what's not important at all. And you can do that for yourself and you can do that in your work because they're not, they don't always correlate. Right. How you see yourself in, in work and what you value can be different to how you are at home. Yeah. Um, and equally, um, understanding you know, it's good to know what works for you, but it's also good to know what's tripping you up, what gets you angry and frustrated and where your triggers are. That's usually where the work is. Um, and if you take responsibility and look at that, then um, that journey doesn't have to be as difficult and as bumpy as uh, many people think. So that's kind of the beginning of the journey is really about starting to develop some awareness and using any of the numerous tools that are out there I did use one once and actually it was quite uh, groundbreaking for me personally called maps M A W P S. I went online to search for it the other day, Daniel, and I couldn't, um, I couldn't find it, but um, it was a psychological tool and I don't know if they used it in private industry, but it had 75 questions and it really gave a really good report as to 
your philosophy, the way that you think, um, the type of work that's good for you, the type of work that you shouldn't go anywhere near. So a really helpful tool. So as time goes on with Daniel and I getting together, we'll be uh, sharing more uh, tools and insights that can be uh, something that you can grab. Now, the human design, actually, if you go on Richard Rubb's uh, website um, and put in your date of birth and your name, it comes up with a profile and you'll start to see several spheres, like circles, and they'll have numbers in them. And on there, it will give you a summary of what the, uh, the, sorry, the gene keys I'm talking about. Yeah, gene keys. And what <laughs> yeah. was that website again? That was, um, it, well, it's just, it's the gene keys and it's Richard Rudd's web, own website. <laughs> And um, when you put your date of birth in, and if you know your time of birth, it can make a difference. I've done it on two time uh, points and one of the keys did change. And then what I did is I read each key to see what I thought fit. And it looks at kind of early on um, your EQ, your emotional quotient, your social quotient, your IQ, but it also looks at what your purpose is and, you know, your reasons for here and what you're most suited to, your destiny. Um, and you can buy the book uh, and I've got the book and it's great. Right. It's very dense. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. I have, um, you know, Mel went through gene keys. Uh, Mel and I have this beautiful wave that we always do kind of the opposite and we end up in the same place, which really tells you the journey is up to you. It's always going to lead you to the same place. Yeah. So for gene keys, you know, obviously it can be a little dense. <laughs> It's the same for human design. It, I too bought that book and it is a very, yeah. it is not a reader. And so it takes time to really kind of get into it. But I also posted in the comment section, um, Richard Rudd for Gene Keys. And then I recommend the Jovian Archive for Human yeah, Design. For the human Design. Yeah, both are really going to tell you, I think Gene Keys uses the light and the shadow, correct? And then Human yeah. Design and is then conscious. Right. Okay. It's consciousness and uh, you're unconscious and you're unconscious. So it's the same thing. They're just using different verbiage and depending on yeah. how you learn it's, there you go. It's going to work out for you. <laughs> so the, and the actual keys link with the I chain and all you do, if you buy the book and I'm not being paid to sell this book, no. you know. it's just <laughs> that I love it. Um, if you say you have got the seventh dinky, it will tell you what the shadow is what the gift is when you come out of the shadow and then what the city of that, which is the highest level you can reach. I and I read a couple of, I, I can only read one, one at a time and I read a lot. Um, but what happens is it really does absorb on your subconscious and it, and it's be beautifully written. I mean, it really is like a whole range of stories in that. So that's, uh, that's the denser stuff, but you can, yeah, that's the denser stuff, but you get to learn more about yourself <laughs> Yeah. And at the end of the day, we're on a journey to find self. So the more work you put in towards that, discovering who you are, what your blueprint looks like, the way that you move in this world, the more wisdom is going to come forward for you. So you can walk yeah. this path with a little more um, confidence, with a little bit more what we call yeah. the solar plexus is online and ready to go. Yeah, it's empowering. And I think, you know, you can uncover aspects of yourself that are dormant or just starting to make their way because um, as we go, like Carl Jung talked about this, we go through different stages of life. And so um, at different stages, we're learning different things. And as we move on in life, other aspects will, will emerge through that maybe behaviors or ways of viewing the world we didn't know about. And that relates right. if you look at the gene keys, but also human design was massively helpful to me. It really helped right. me understand about, it's great having lots of ideas and everything, but you know, sometimes it's about time and isn't it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah which we're learning. <laughs> <laughs> so we've learned that lesson several times. Several um, times. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk a little epigenetics here. Right. So again, <laughs> it's not my specialism, but I did actually work uh, for a few years with public health. And uh, it was when epigenetics was really starting to make its way in, in general health and understanding. Um, but the crux of it is, is we're not our genes. You know, uh, we're born with genes. And there was something called a twin study study done twin studies done years ago uh, where they followed the life and lifestyles of twins uh, who had exactly the same genes and what happens when uh, you are exposed 
uh, to particular diets, particular experiences, um, environments where you live. Um, and that all was influencing the way that the genes developed. And we also know, I think it's Greg Braden, possibly, who looks at how cells respond um, to in the body when they're exposed to certain thoughts and processes, a bit like Dr. Remoto's experiments. So um, we're not our genes and we can be susceptible to particular illnesses and difficulties, yep. just as our mental health can be susceptible. So it's not about ruling that out. However, you can, uh, diabetes runs in my family. So I've been mindful for years, you know, that I really do need to be mindful about what I eat and how I exercise and what I do so whether we escape everything or whether we veered off because you only know what's appeared you don't necessarily know what you prevented um but again it's a it's an understanding that we are a self in an environment eating particular range of food yep. and influencing our mind body and soul through the incoming uh, data food and everything and so if you want to influence your wealth uh, and happiness changing uh you know changing some of the things that you eat can really make a big difference if you don't feel tired in the afternoon uh because uh you might be susceptible to the um the impact that wheat has on you for example then you'll function better if you're not functioning you're not performing at work and you're coming to the attention of your bosses so some very basic changes can help but right. we i'm already aware we we're potentially sort of throwing out a lot of information we're going to help people um sort of tease out from that what will be most relevant in the second half but absolutely um absolutely. And some of the other elements to that have come through in the last few years now, uh, they've become more relevant to me as well, because um, I went through a process when I was training as a therapist. It's all about the psychology and it's the mind. Then you understand about the emotions. But the bit I was kind of ignoring was the body and how we experience life through the body. And it was only until I had my car accident and I started doing yoga and I, I trained in yin yang yoga that I started to realize about how uh, trauma, any kind of trauma is held within the body. And we know this in um in, in Chinese meridian uh, therapy and medicine, they understand that the system can become sl slowed down. Uh, the energy energetic systems can get, uh, get sludgy or stuck. And there is a whole range of approaches uh, that can help that energy shift within the body, whether it's Qigong or uh, chakra work or meridian work, Chinese five element works, which some yoga teachers apply. But it was really about getting in the body and starting to notice the uh, influence that that has. So um, we've talked about this as well, haven't we, Danielle, that a lot of people in the spiritual world spend a lot of time in the upper chakras. Yes. And not so much yeah. time uh, rooted in, in the body. body. And yeah. yet trauma sits within, you know, the root chakra, which is about safety and security yep. and personal self and self-esteem sits within the solar plexus chakra, which is our personal power and our sexuality uh, is actually creativity as well. So if any of these systems in the body are blocked or slowed down and they can vary like everything can go up and down, then it may well be that we um, try a different approach. And, and it can be any of those physical movement, even dance, you know, there's some yoga teachers now that are starting to create a more movement dance style yoga. Um, because um, I think we're starting to realize that staying static, talking to somebody in a chair, sometimes people need to move and they need to put some real strong moves into what they're doing to shift and, and and move out of that state and it certainly worked for, for me it's one of the ways that I shift out of uh, emotional states at times so um, the nervous system is being really researched at the moment there's something called polyvagus polyvagal theory and in particular to people who've experienced trauma but you know a huge uh, part of the population has experienced trauma because you alluded earlier to famine, famine, and mm -hmm. famine has been rife around the world uh, at several time points in history. And that is that awareness of that and that memory of that uh, can live within uh, the DNA and the cells. And yeah. so, and I do want to just say right here that this is where when we, before we had the scientific studies, this is what we call family curse. 
in the spiritual mm. community, when we speak of family curses, we're actually speaking epigenetics. We're see, we're speaking what the family line, what they ate, what they did, the way that they believed and how that entered into the cell pattern, the blueprint pattern of how you're made. That is what we would refer to as a family curse. Yeah. So I do want to, I did want to push that out there for those that are on the spiritual path. So they have a little bit more understanding as to why um, bringing in more science and psychology is going to be important for this path so that you're not feel like you're fighting an invisible monster. You're fighting something that you have absolute control over and changing that narrative and that perspective can change everything for you. Thank you for that, because I'd never made that connection. That's really helpful. So I've le learned something new today as well. <laughs> I'd never thought about it in that way. So that's really cool. Well, um, that's why you keep me around, Mel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just those tidbits of information to add. <laughs> just little bits of information here and there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's really interesting because there are, you know, there's many cultures that still believe in, in certain practices to to get the demons out, out your house now. Um, there's nothing um, wrong with some of no, them. No, it's um, ritual work. And how does, how does things, how do you get things to get that neural pathway that then leads to the cell? Yeah. Ritual yeah. work. It's important that we continue these practices as a spiritual, as spiritual people, because it keeps you in alignment. It keeps you, your frequency in a place that says I am in charge. And that is really at the end of the yeah. day, what psychology is telling you to do. So we're just learning how to bridge the gap between the two and give you more information for this journey. That's, that's yeah. really the whole point. Yeah. And taking the best of what's been around for thousands of years, including what's coming out in the new research, because the research is really just showing what um, a lot of people have uh, I've known. already known. That's the beauty. <laughs> like like time. we're coming in at the greatest time for spirituality. Mm -hmm. We're starting to really prove the esoteric knowledge that we've always known. Exactly. So peer support, mentors and group work are really going to support you in this journey correct yeah so we we mentioned that earlier and so there's a lot of people uh online who are running workshops or peer support programs again if it fits and you resonate with it uh, for that time do that it can make a difference and i i mean the fact that most of us went on to some kind of platform to work over the last few years uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, we've all realized that, you know, that they're really beneficial to us and we can really get a lot out of sitting in our living room and uh, tapping into some kind of support. Having something regular also helps. So I think consistency is always key. So it doesn't always have to be a therapist, but if you find that you really need to tell your story over and over again and you're not moving past um, something that's bothering you and your friends are starting to... <laughs> to you know to lose patience because sometimes yeah. people do um then that's where uh you see someone that maybe has just got a bit of the edge in terms of understanding how and helping you move forward but it's really just um you know about being able to set some small goals yeah, and definitely. we'll have a look at that in the moment um just be aware as well there are pitfalls in your personal development journey whether that is uh, listening to people who profess to know what they're talking about and they don't, they haven't been on that journey themselves or they're trying right. to sell you something um, because it's very shiny and gold and, uh, and it's going to turn your life around. Um, and there are times where you'll get, you'll get moments of distress. You know, yeah. I've been in yoga sessions where, where I've cried and I'm like, I don't understand, you know, cause I thought it was about meditation and being happy and doing, you know. <laughs> no, nope. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, sometimes the deeper yoga work and meditation can do nothing but produce massive amounts of crying and yeah. snot running down your face. But, you know, afterwards, <laughs> you really do feel that sense of relief and that you've cleared yeah. something that was really deep inside of you enough to where it can unearth itself so that you can focus and face that. So don't allow those pitfalls to be yeah. the things that stop you, that this is part of the process of standing back up. How do you learn discernment unless you discern the incorrect way? How do you learn to trust your intuition 
if you didn't purposefully go against it and see how that fall, you know, how that plays out for you. You know, we're curious scientists on this journey. And the more curious you are, the better off you're going to be yeah. in the journey, because this is all about learning and wisdom and growing from the mistakes or perceived mistakes that we make in this world. Yeah. So those experiences of emotion that come up all emotions are transient they shouldn't be with you all the time anyway right and if you're experiencing a a flush of that if you're experiencing emotions for the first time because you've suppressed them locked them down are ashamed of them don't think it's right to share or it makes you weak or you know any of those things if you're quite new to your own emotional experience then it can feel scary and fearful and you you might want to block them out with with something else um everyone's got different coping mechanisms but once you once you start allowing your body to do its job and sometimes release what has been there a long time the energy that's been stored up that can keep you feeling flat and depressed can actually in increase your levels of vitality in such a huge way a lot of people who are depressed are really they just really need space to be able to tap into some of that hurt and pain that has ever been ignored or dismissed so at the beginning of any journey if you're starting to experience don't be scared they don't stay around everything's a process everything can start like a I I used to talk about uh grief when when my mum passed and I experienced grief um I used to feel that in terms of huge waves, tsunami waves. Yes. Hitting me. And I would uh, some early on, you know, you go from a numb state and then you go to a state of experience, lots of strong emotions. And when it hit me, it would hit me out of the blue sometimes, or I was just in that state as time went on the they weren't tsunami waves anymore there were surfer waves and I started to see myself as a surfer riding the wave that the wave would come in I'd have to breathe through it so I'd have some breathing exercises and the wave would go out and over time the waves then get gentler and gentler occasionally it's a tsunami wave again occasionally it's something that hits hits us in a big way and sometimes I don't even know and that's just because we're human and we are exposed to so much and have experienced so much so don't be don't be afraid of those don't be afraid of experiencing them if they are too much and it's happening a lot then again get some support and talk through but again draw in you know while you're experiencing that and I can't really draw much but I dabble in doodling and doodling um, really helps to focus and just stay in that moment. So I just wanted to flag that up, the pitfalls. It can happen at yoga. Yeah. It can happen when you're journaling. It can happen when you're in a workshop. So don't allow the experience of something that feels uncomfortable to prevent you from going to a workshop, going to a peer group, going to somewhere, because everybody's has to take that first step at yeah. some point in their life. And yeah. I think it's incredibly courageous people who do that. Absolutely. You know, again, just follow up with Mel, let that trigger lead you to your truth, lead you to the space where you can heal that trigger. You know, once that first step is taken, what we say, it's about three times in that's in a cycle, about the third time you come into a new cycle, you start to get like the reins on, okay, I'm in a new space. I'm about to heal. Those first few times can really just take the breath out of you. Just remember you are more courageous than you're currently giving yourself credit for. And I will always follow the, the, the phone a friend rule, which is when you cannot come up with things to be proud of things to be happy about, or things to say, I am deserving of you phone, a friend, you phone, a confidant, you phone somebody that you trust and ask them to give you information about them that they could be proud of that you could be proud of and watch how that changes your dynamic with them. Watch how that changes, how you feel about yourself just walk through the fire. It's worth facing the fear because on the other side of fear really is the gift. And if I couldn't say this and I know it's cliche, but I wouldn't say it if I didn't feel it's truth every single time. And sometimes are scarier for me. I don't care how far along I am in my journey. I, you know, I have stopped and said, I think I have to give up. I can't do it anymore. And when I allow myself to face that fear of why and walk through that fire and really just pull in everything I know to be true, that wave subsides and I'm back in calm waters. 
Mm. Because as Mel said, feelings come up and through you, but they do not stay. Don't allow them to stay, but allow them to come Mm. because that is important work. So one of the final notes to be aware of, and it comes from sort of Freud's theory, really, of of projection is, um, you know, we can we can be quite harsh on ourselves, but we can also get caught in. Uh, focusing on other people and that's quite endemic in in lots of different circles so really step back and try and pull back from getting so involved and over involved in other people's business yeah unless you're giving I would say unless you're giving something that helps them money love gifts your presence your smile your comedy then then step back because um it's not again going back to the brain and the amygdala it will just keep firing you up and it will hamper your progress and it's it's just a way that sometimes people deal with when they have a lot going on they'd rather put it on somebody else yeah so that is basic psychology 101 freud's idea of uh, transference and projection and projection and it is endemic in society we do it all the time yes it is yes it <laughs> is and then i'm going to reflect that back because as you said unless you're handing over good advice or a gift or something positive just mind your own i would say that as a human being you need to follow this guideline for others as well yeah. It's none of your business, what other people think about you, what other people say about you. They are in their own projections, their own harm, their own trauma response. Yeah. Therefore, one of my favorite uses of this is I always make the grand assumption that everything is okay, unless the other person says it's not. Yeah. And the moment that the other person says it's not, I am now prepared because I haven't worked in all of these different lines of how, when, what, where, and why I'm just making a grand assumption. And Mm. now I know that my response isn't coming from a triggered place. It's coming from a place of genuine, you know, genuine understanding and genuine concern. And then we take, obviously this goes beyond steps 101. Then we start and wait on that survival response and push through to the thrive response. You know, Mel and I have had a conversation once where we just had to sit and wait for the thrive response to come out. And then when we had that conversation, it looked completely different than if we sat there in our survival response and yeah. had that conversation. It, it's just, it's just how people are and that's okay. And we just yeah. have to be more understanding of that because we have been the, the person that has projected in our life, regardless if you think you have or not, let me assure you, you have, we all have, of course we, we all have. have. So, <laughs> so I think this is a great time to make sure that at this point, we're going to start doing some attunement and some things that you would probably want to write down. We're giving you some journal prompts here. These journal prompts can either, if you are quick on the draw, you can write these down and answer them as we go. If not, allow these to be journal prompts for the next however long you need. Again, we're handing you some homework. You don't have to do it. There's not a quiz at the end. This is just for you to be able to walk this journey with those tools we've been discussing throughout this entire webinar. Hmm. So while you guys are making sure all of that is ready, Mel and I are just going to sit here and look pretty for a minute. (laughs) (laughs) All right. All right. So we probably have everything available now and this we're going to do, um, the, the first step that whole first hour was just us introducing all of the things that we are bringing forward to you. These things won't feel as overwhelming when we enter into the workshop because we're going to be working more one-on-one and we're going to be able to get um, more depth to what it is that we're presenting to you. Again, the beauty of what Mel and I are bringing to this table isn't that we're asking you to pay for a workshop. We're handing you the information freely. If you would like to have it in an active presence and have the acknowledgement in that moment and really work through it. This is why we're going to bring in that workshop because obviously Mel and I are really working hard at giving out as much information as we can, but our time is truly valuable. And the things that we can give you in a more one-on-one will look different than all of this that we're presenting to you now. 
All right, guys, we are going to start this by taking a couple of deep breaths. We're not going to walk ourselves into meditation yet, because what I want you to do is really see how you are. Now, we've had an hour of sitting in this group setting and having this conversation, so you should be pretty normalized at this point in how your, your normal feelings are day to day. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take that, that one breath, and as we do that, we're going to sit inside of our body for just a moment. I want you to ask yourself, how am I feeling? That's anxiety, nervousness, depression, manic behavior. None of it's a wrong answer. Just write it down. The more you put in, the better you're going to feel. So on one of the other chats, I'm seeing somebody saying, I am feeling calm, which is great. I love that you're feeling calm because this is the goal of what Mel and I are trying to bring to you a lot of information in a very calming way. So what thoughts are going around in your head? What are the things that are triggering the thought? Every thought comes from a feeling that is a vibration that you've set yourself. So what is that feeling behind the thought? Is it one of excitement? Is it one of fear? Is it one of love? So the next thing I want you to do after you finish writing that is how do you want to feel? What helps you? So what we're going to get into is what's going to help you learn to relax and feel good. So I want you to consider a time that that's happened and, and really try to fit inside of that feeling. So, you know, you want to feel X, Y, Z. I know I want to feel peace. I know I want to feel joy. These are things that I want to feel. So I know that whatever I'm doing on this journey, the goal where I've put the arrow to point at to land is for peace and joy. Um, so overwhelmed feelings are completely natural as well. Acknowledge them, understand that we are in this process of giving a lot of information that are coming through and it can feel very overwhelming, but in that moment is the, is that this divine moment, if you will, is the moment where you can start picking from the overwhelmed feelings and start asking yourself why this is a journal prompt for later. Why am I feeling this feeling inside of overwhelm? Why am I perceiving this feeling and this overwhelmed feeling? And then the next thing I want you to do is set an intention. I want you to decide this is where I want my goal to be. As I just said, I want joy and I want peace in my life on a daily existence. So what we are going to need to do is focus that energy towards whatever it is. You know, um, if you're working inside a shadow, you can do uh, something along the lines of moon work. You can direct your energy towards the moon. If you're working with grounding yourself, you can direct that energy towards mother earth. If you're looking to shine a little brighter as it is Leo season, put that intention towards the sun. Um, so it is okay to feel confused because that just means that you're moving into new territory. You're landing yet again into a space that feels, that looks familiar, but doesn't feel the same. Confusion is amazing. You want to have moments of confusion. They won't stay forever. Don't confuse confusion with overwhelm. Confusion is, I'm just not sure where I'm at. It can be an exciting process if you allow it to be, or it could just really break you down, allow confusion to lead you to some truth, some clarity. Okay, guys, now that we've gotten that stuff written down, if you don't mind joining me in a quick meditation, this meditation is going to be very easy. It's going to look like you sitting comfortably. You can lay down, your eyes can be open, they can be closed. Honestly, I prefer them closed because the journey that we're going to take, and it won't take very long, is all about attuning to self. We're really going to get ourselves into our own body. And then when we're done, we're going to note again in that journal what it is that we are feeling, and then you're going to see the difference. It's really a cool, quick process that anybody can use at any time. 
So at this point, I really want you to get into a comfortable position, find out whatever it is that you need to do to find that comfortable position. You can be sitting in a chair, laying in a bed on the floor. You can be holding your child. It doesn't matter whatever works for you. Now, what I'm going to want you guys to do, if you can, is close your eyes. And I want us to start breathing naturally in through the nose and out through the mouth. Remember, it is okay if your breathing is not in tune with my breathing. It is okay for the breath to take longer than mine or to work faster than mine. I am simply keeping myself at a certain beat. So we're going to breathe in the nose and out of the mouth. We're going to focus on the breath going in and out. To feel safe and supported is one of our basic needs. Together, we will create a sense of support and safety within so we may break this cycle. So let's start by relaxing any tension that you're feeling as you breathe in the nose and out of the mouth. I'm going to count down from five. And at this point, I'm going to take a five second count breath in through the nose. Hold the breath for another five seconds and then release the breath from your mouth for five seconds. We are going to do this three times. Five, four, three, two. One, breathe in, hold, release, in, hold, release. In, hold, and release. As you return to your normal rhythm of breathing in the nose and out of the mouth, I want you to focus your energy on the tips of your toes. It could feel warm. It can feel cold. It can have any sensation. Just focus the sensation to the toes. And then we're going to allow it to move up through the feet, into the ankles, up through the calves and shins, slowly making its way up into your knees, up through your thighs, around your hips, up through your abdomen, into your chest, feeling the wonderful sensation. We're going to go up the spine and into the shoulders, down through the arms, into the elbows, through the forearm, into the hands, and down to the fingertips. We're going to take this energy and move it through the neck and throat, up through the back of the head, up through the chin and the mouth, into our cheeks, up through the eyes, and meeting up at the crown of our head. I want you to now take your attention to this beautiful golden white light 
that is centered at the top of your head and allow this beautiful shimmering golden white light to push back down through your body as a pillar, down into your feet, growing roots and pushing through into the core of our dearest mother earth. As it wraps through the core and it pushes back up through the feet, up through the hips and the abdomen, through your arms and your neck, all the way back up to the crown of your head, shooting back up and around, creating a 360 degree protective, loving, nurturing circle. I want you to start relaxing back into your breath, taking note of every breath coming in and out. I want you to begin to feel your feet on the ground, laying on the bed, sitting in your chair. I want you to become aware of the cool air pushing across your skin. I want you to be aware of the noises going on around you. And as you breathe, allow your awareness to open your eyes and come back to this world inside of your body where you belong. And as we come out of this, I want us to start writing down immediately how you're feeling, what that moment of grounding into your own body caused you to feel, why we are doing this is so that you can attune to who you are in your truth of how your body should feel. I don't know about you, Mel, but I'm feeling pretty calm. Yeah, that's. Uh, I always love your meditations, though. When people don't know before our podcasts, I often often ask you to do them as well, don't I? Yeah, I, it always it always throws me off, but I love that you love them, and I love being able to provide them. Some of them get a little strange. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be what I called the grounding and relaxation meditation. As you can see, it's simple. You are simply checking the breath, which helps close down our guardian, our ego mind, because instead of focusing on everything else, we're focusing on the breath. Mm. And then we're going to increase that breath and we're going to count because what is it that studies have shown? Three five second count breaths immediately reset your systems. Yeah. It's, yeah. You switch your system immediately. So you take your three long breaths and then you start at the feet. We always start at the ground at the root and we work our way up. And all you're doing is getting in tune with every ounce of your body and allowing it to connect to you and how it feels. And as you can see, the th- the mind can create a nervous, the amygdala can create a nervous system response. Mm. But the more we tune in, as Mel said earlier, to the body, the more we see its truth, which is calm, which is peace, which is joy, which is insert whatever words may, it made you feel. And I love that Taya from Tbilisi said that she's feeling relaxed. That is amazing. That is the goal. So now we're going to, now that we've attuned, we're going to start considering, considering the intention. We're going to write it down. We're going to have any insights or questions we have to ask ourselves at this point. I welcome any questions that you have, any response systems that might've come up, any triggers that might've come up while you were tuning into your body, because although for some tuning into the body can be a very nice experience for others. It can pull up a lot of triggered system responses. Mm. All of this is well within normal ranges. If you have a question about it and you feel relaxed or confident enough to put it into the um, chat, please do. If not write those down and create a journal prompt for yourself over the next few weeks and work on it. So now is Oh, good, Jack. I am so glad that you're well chilled. That makes me feel good. I'm glad that that worked for you as well. So now 
Oh yeah, Casey, you know, that's beautiful. I do want to bring that up because as physical beings, I love that you brought this up, Casey, as physical beings, some of us, I always call this my earth sign babies. My earth sign babies love to get in that physical. We're thinking yoga, breath work, we're going cold plunges. And Casey said <laughs> that he brought up cold plunges and that is something that he's been working on to get himself out of the mind and back into the body. There's not a wrong way to do I'll it. Do it. And, <laughs> yeah, and have, exactly, you're also an earth sign. <laughs> so. I don't do the cold plunges though. <laughs> He, Casey's braver than me. I might do it one time, but that would be it. I'd be like, I'm good on that. Thanks. I'm very much in my body and it's uncomfortable. Thanks. So, so with that being said, you know, that is a great, another great tool that we can use, especially if you are more into your physical beingness is to create these opportunities of cold plunges, meditation, uh, yoga work, Tai Chi, um, so some of the questions I would love for you guys to ask yourself in a journal prompt is going to be what changes are needed? What am I not happy with? What do I already love and enjoy? Where am I now? And where do I want to be? So those are some really good journal prompts to ask yourself in between now and the workshop or in between now and whenever you're ready to answer them. And now we get to move in to what it is that we've been very excited to present to you in this free webinar. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mel. I, I don't, I, I know I'm terrible at interrupting. <laughs> I do want to say before you get started on this, another question that is a really great journal pop prompt is, what stops or prevents me from taking any steps towards change? And on this, I would, again, I would love to see you guys ask that question or say that out loud <laughs> to us or into this, you know, this uh, communication platform that we're using on YouTube. And if you have any of those things, then maybe at this point during the, we can call you for, uh, to step forward as a volunteer and work on one of these well-being wills, the cycle of change or the timeline together. So give yourself the opportunity to take this webinar to its fullest extent for you, because we are going to have a minimum of one volunteer step forward for each process so that you can get a hands-on view of what it is we're trying to tell you to do. So what we've done is really just introduce you to some of the key questions that, you know, if you were going to go and see a life coach and, and particular therapist, um, you would want to consider. Um, you can write them down. And often the first response is the best response. So nobody's reading what you're writing. So just consider what that is. Um, and thinking about what prevents you making those changes that needs a little bit of reflection because this is where we can start to see, is it that I don't think I've got the money or people don't like me, or if I do that, you know, X, Y, and Z is going to happen. So what, uh, whatever your responses to that can start to indicate what kind of beliefs you're carrying at the moment. And then you're able to review that and see whether or not, um, you know, whether or not there's anything that any truth in that, you know, sometimes, sometimes we need to stop and reflect and see if that change is a good change. So this is all about starting to understand who you are and where you are. And that in itself uh, is a piece of work for your journal anyway. And those reflections, once you start asking yourself, your unconscious mind, these questions, it allows your system to start opening up and giving you that information. Then you start to ask what kind of changes are needed and why do you want those changes? And when you say you're not happy with some something, I'm going to break that down in the wheel in a moment. But I, I was smiling when you were talking there because uh, Casey said, try the, the cold plunge. Um, my, uh, my son does the cold plunge. I've tried to just turn the shower cooler. <laughs> yeah. Look, taking me from lobster mode and water to the cold is a huge step. But I just told Casey I would try it because I am here to be the curious scientist and I will try this, this and see what it does for my physical body. Okay, so next time, Danielle, on, on the webinar, I'd like yeah. to hear more about that. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I died and came back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I was sort of uh, drawn towards it because I think we lose. Casey might know this better than me. Uh, I think it's something like 17 calories per um uh per second or the you lose a lot more calories anyway or your body does because it has to acclimatize to the cold and then acclimatize so your body system has to work extra hard so that i know that's definitely one of the uh, uh the the things that um is worth giving a go um lately uh So Casey's sharing something about the cold shower. Yeah, I see that. The cold shower, the air made it miserable. And I know he does have a tank because I've seen him. Thermopotent. The yeah. This, and so I love that. Thermogenic fat burning. See, that's guys, it. do you see why we're building a community? Not one, <laughs> not two, not three, not four people are going to know all of the great ways to help you succeed in this world. But bringing a community in will, because if it doesn't work for one, it will most certainly work for another person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and anyone who's into fitness, if fitness is your thing, um, then understanding how the body strips itself of fat is, is what Casey's is alluding to. And, um, and the tried and tested methods in, in the air forces and the army, um, you know, it's been around a long time and it, uh, and it gets the results that they're looking for. So, um, but I'll be interested to hear more from you next time, Danielle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, where are we going next? I think I was going to do a little bit of a whistle stop tour um, to, oh no, there's a couple of things I was going to cover to some of the great people that are out there that we wanted to give homage to because, um, you know, all the people that have wrote books and created workshops and shared their information and knowledge with me. And a lot of that has been free, has been massively, massively beneficial to my own learning and capacity to just enjoy life more and have more peace and find some ways forward, whether yeah. that's in the workplace or in family life. Um, the other aspect to ask and write in your journal, what beliefs, values, patterns or programs can be operating that are no longer valid or useful. Now that can be a bit deep, but when you ask yourself the other question, especially of one about the limitation, that's the one that can allude to the beliefs and the values exercise that are shared with you earlier. Anyone that sends us an email, we can send you some of these direct links so you um, so you can come up with the, the right material. Um, going back to the programs, a lot of those programs have been put in by society and whatever fence we lay on in terms of you know our ideas about the, the uh, altruistic nature of government and society those patterns have been uh, ingrained in us but part of empowerment is learning which ones there are and sometimes you just have to choose one you know so going back to Casey's point if fitness isn't your thing um, there can be a pattern around that your belief about exercise your age your weight your gender all of that and that may be something that actually is outdated because of uh, we know that a lot of the diet industry, for example, yeah. makes a lot of money out of people. And a lot of the information and advice they give is utter rubbish. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we still buy it. Again, if we tune into our body, our body will tell us what we need as far as exercise, diet, the things that we need to bring into it to make it be successful along yeah. with your journey. It's yeah. funny because it, the more you tune in to that body, the more it's going to, it gets more, it's going to express its blueprint to you. So what doesn't work for me is going to work for Mel and what works for Mel may not work for me. And that's quite yeah. okay because I have tuned into what my body needs are and those are fluctuating. So the more I stay tuned in, the, the longer I'll know that maybe this week I need to put more protein and fatty foods into my body, but next week it's going to be more vegetables and fruits and just allowing that, that response system to really come online so that you're eating a healthier lifestyle. You're doing healthier things for yourself and your mind is in a healthier position. Again, I really yeah. do subscribe to the three brain rule. And that really is that mind, body, spirit that we all talk about. So there's that. <laughs> no, that's really helpful. Thank you. And um, in terms of programs and patterns, um, there are there are some programs, if you think about what you believe about your class and your gender, then you'll start to unpick some patterns. You know, if you're working class, does that mean you can only have a particular job and you can only have access to certain aspects of society? 
So they're the big programs and we can have some smaller programs running. But as we do the workshops and some of the webinars, we'll be able to help people unpick them a little bit more. Um, but in terms of managing uh, society, you know, um, one of the people that I have spent time listening to a lot, and I think he has a really lo uh, a lot of good to say uh, and interesting things to say about how society is created is, you know, society has its own uh, segments and uh, cultures that have shared values, beliefs, uh, traditions and dress. And there's a reason for that, you know, because our culture and how we identify can help us feel safe. And going back to Danielle talking about, you know, the, the Megasaurus that came out and, um, you know, roared at us when we're coming out of the cave. Uh, there's a reason why people group and get together, but there's a downside and an upside to everything. You can have closed cultures and open cultures. And Jordan Peterson writes a lot about the idea of chaos and order. And we've seen that uh, really starting, uh, well, we saw that during COVID. Some, some aspects of uh, societies in the world got very strict and there was a lot of order and other uh, aspects, there wasn't, there wasn't really a, as many rules. And the, we, we constantly have in this interplay between chaos and order. That's society, but if you take it into your own self in your own life, if you've got rituals and routine, then you can create a lot of order and it can help you manage your mental health and wellbeing. But if your order's too tight, it, it can dampen creativity. So this it's not right or wrong, but you know, a lot of spiritual people in the 60s went on the path and they um traveled for five, six years. And that's great and that helps you evolve as a soul. But at the same time, it can help you miss out on some of the things in society as well that uh can be beneficial to you. And that's just something else to consider again, a sort of another uh deep uh question uh to to examine a, you know another webinar or workshop so some of the key people i'm going to whiz through these quickly because just uh, we'll put the names in the chat um and i'll tell you what they're kind of good for if you want to know more about it you go and explore because they've all got something on youtube and they've all got uh information out there that you just put the name in the system and see what comes up so we talked about bob proctor's quote earlier he's at the very early uh, end of i think he's 85 now uh, at uh, personal development um he was working with nightingale conan who were making cds that people would you know uh, listen to at home uh, in terms of professional and personal development um and my key phrase for him is really just how to go from broke to stoke really because he turned his whole life around at the age of 23 because he had amazing mentors that basically said what well, your way's not working why don't you try mine and he did and he turned his life around Jody Spencer is talking a lot at the moment, the mind, body and transformation, how to clear some of those deeper patterns. Abraham Hicks, law of attraction, uh, looks at relationships, culture and family. Andrew Huberman, one of my favorites, uh, brain researcher. He looks at mental health, in particular things like ASD, the impacts of stress, ADHD, and how the mind and body work. And he's got some fascinating stuff and it's not academic, uh, it's really accessible. Uh, we've got Tom Evans UK. Uh, if you Google him, uh, make sure it's Tom Evans UK, um, the playwright and the book uh, writer. He does a lot of stuff around esoteric, but uh, anyone who's into time and space and learning how to write books at speed or meditation and mindfulness, he's got a lot of really brilliant meditations that appeal to people often as well in industry, in the corporate world, um, outside of the usual spiritual uh, quarters. Um, and then you've got Sadhu Guru, which uh, both uh, Daniel and I like. He's done massive amounts uh, around the planet and he's very, uh, very wise, knowledgeable and has a lot of research, mixes a lot with researchers and uh, about the brain, mind, body, diet, relationships, everything, Sadhu Guru. Uh, he's a mystic. And uh, if you want to explore the biology of your beliefs, and the way that cells influence the body and how your mind influences the cells, then look at Greg Braden and Lee Poulos. Uh, so actually, I think I've got his set of CDs. That's how far back I'm going. Um, about... <laughs> I'll admit I'm sorry. it now. You just aged me so hard. <laughs> yeah. I'll admit it now. I was around at the time of the CD. Um, <laughs> so mm -hmm. Lee Poulos, uh, I think it was something like 10 CDs, but phenomenal information contained within them that he's only 
only starting to come through uh, the general sort of popular culture now. Um, thinking about the five ways to well-being, uh, well-being is now the popular term that's replacing mental health quite a lot, but they are distinct separate entities in a way. Uh, so understanding the five ways to well-being can be a way you look at the different structures in your life. Me and you, Daniel, have talked a lot, haven't we, about Mel Robbins. Now, I love Mel Robbins. Very simple, basic idea, five-second rule. You wake up in the morning. If you suffer from depression, lack of motivation, you can't get out of bed, um, and you've, you're being swamped, and, and that's kind of what, how her personal story was. She applies the idea that your brain has really just got five seconds before all of that negative information and the things that drown you out and make you really tired anyway flood your system so you've got five seconds seconds to make a decision get out of bed and if you apply that 30 days at least for some people it's 60 or 90 because it depends how long you've been struggling with certain aspects but if you apply that consistent rule every day don't, you don't always have to do it at weekend you can have a you know a day off you will start to see some um, differences uh, we've got Crayon, Lee Carroll. Hey, he's a channeler, an author, a little bit out there for some people, but um, you you like him, Daniel. Did you say he's quite uplifting? And uh... Yeah, I would call him um, more of an uplifting channeler. And right. I, okay, so his name is <clears throat> Lee Harris, or Lee Carroll, sorry, Lee Carroll, and he um, channels from Cryon. So I would recommend him when you just need to start feeling like, that humanity has hope. If that's where you're kind of at is this loss of, of hope for humanity. He really brings in a lot of hope for humanity and kind of empowers you in that way. So I really enjoy him. Thank you. And Steve Noble is British. Um, I did some of his very early uh, spiritual uh, workshops and he was the first person I'd come across in my, I, I used to go to the Mind, Body and Spirit Festival, which is a huge festival in London every year and meet a lot of people. And was the first person I came into contact with that talked about the value of also looking at the shadow and being a psychotherapist, uh, you know, the shadow is, is what you're aware of and work with all the time, but it very was missing in the narrative uh, in spiritual circles. Uh, he's got a website called The Soul Matrix. He gives out a lot of free meditations I really like his stuff and he's done something more recently on spiritual hygiene, but he also looks at the feminine and the masculine aspects uh, in really interesting ways and transitions. Terence McKenna, plant medicine. So we know that plant medicine and holistic approaches to health is becoming more popular, especially as we're aware of the impact that um, a lot of the way our food is produced is having on us. Uh, both Danielle and I absolutely love Ram Dass, Timothy Leary. If you've not seen the film about him uh, in his early days, a Harvard professor, clinical psychologist, absolutely amazing in his field, then took himself off to India. Um, I think he was there, I don't know if it was five years, I, I think it was longer. Um, and then they came back to the US and became, uh, well, ev you know, everybody started to see him as a guru, but I've listened to hundreds of hours. He's a, uh, He's able to blend those spiritual ideas and psychological ideas really well. Yeah, um, I would say that uh, Ram Dass or Timothy Leary really was the inspiration for us bridging the psychology and spirituality. Yes, yeah. yeah, that's true. And I've got a friend and I don't know if she's on uh, the chat here that I went on a road trip with last September uh, where we were playing a lot of Ram Dass and we were talking about that exactly that. Um, I think 2016, I'd, as a professional, psychology was my day life and my spirituality with, even though it's not, you know, with spiritual beings was out there, you know, you hide your crystals and your magic wands and your tarot cards in your day job. Um, but I started to want to integrate the two. And so the journey that I've taken with Danielle to do so has been massively empowering for me because uh, they're so symbiotic. There's, there's so many uh, parallels. It's just the information is, um, is written differently and <laughs> done differently for different people. So, uh, um, and then Paul Selleck, and then I did want to say that Jack also brought up Jordan Peterson and I don't know why we didn't write, we talk about Jordan Peterson all the time and Jordan Peterson is a, a great, he will, you know, I don't, I can't, for me, Jordan Peterson has really broken me out of this, um, 
I call them solar plexus work for me. He right. really breaks me out of my own shell and brings me to saying uh, this knowing that I am I am worthy of pushing myself and and forwarding and advancing in all of the the different places I want to. That's how I reflect Jordan Peterson. Yeah. I, and sometimes his his dialogue can be quite deep and you have to listen to him a few times. Yes. But I read his, uh, he wrote the seven rules for life. And I actually loved a lot of the things that he said about parents him as well. That was, uh, and I know he's worked with a lot of parents because he's, I think he's done thousands of hours of work um with with his clients um so yeah i have a lot of respect for him i know he gets a hard time because of some of his uh, views but uh having views and stimulating discussion for very hard topics yep is where we've only really just got to in this society so yeah. um it, it triggers a lot of people and people get very angry with that yep. but you can't silence that because um that's very healthy and that only used to sit within the frame of my therapy work where we would have those hard discussions um and it wasn't existing out there so uh it's tough when that erupts and and there's a fallout from that but it's very healthy as well at the same time i agree and just because somebody says something doesn't mean that you have to agree with it right that's exactly. where our discernment comes in and say i do not subscribe to that and then carry forward yeah um some so, other info oh i'm sorry go sorry i think that's you now yeah okay so other information that can be really helpful is for i sit in more the spiritual side of things we've given you a list of a lot of the people that have played an active role in our, uh, growing and healing journey. And so some of the other things that you can really use is the acknowledgement that you are more like a plant and not a robot. And like anything else, you go through your seasons, you go through where you're a seed and you need to hermit and you need to go in and then you go all the way to the blossoming of spring and summer, correct? And then it just cycles back in. It's always death and rebirth. So the more we pay attention to things like the seasons that we know in the summer is you're in your solstice, it's time to come out of the shell. It's time to feel more free. It's time to take that light in. And in the winter, we start to come back into self. We start to really go through the deeper work because we're inside more. We're not as, um, we're not as affected by the sunlight because we're not in the sunlight as much. Um, moon, the moon, the cycle of the moon is probably one of my favorite ways to kind of see where we are at in our cycle because regardless of what it is that you subscribe to, there is scientific evidence that we are not only made up with over 70% of water, but we're also bioluminescent beings. So if energy can affect us, it's going to affect us. And we need to pay attention to things like the moon cycle to see where the cycle is in the moon and then reflect that to ourselves and say, why am I feeling what I'm feeling? What stage of the moon, what stage of the cycle of the moon am I in? And you can easily do a quick search engine search of this and then carry yourself forward, knowing that you might be in a waning or a waxing gibbous, or you might be in this full moon energy. Just allow the reflection of what the, the grand design that this universe has pushed forward for us, allow that to reflect to your inner well-being and to your inner knowledge. And then we can move forward. Um, a little more with ease, knowing that we are simply a reflection of the things that are going on in this universe. Okay. So, oh, so I do want to bring up that, uh, go ahead and take a look at the chats for Casey. He's talking about Gary V, which actually I kind of like Gary V. He is an interesting character. And I've not heard um, of Gary V. I thought he meant Gary Vanacek to start with, but Gary oh, V. Yeah, Gary V. Yeah, he's a fun one. And then I do like that Jack said, people that are controversial cause debate. And debate is really where we need to be. We've come to this point in society where we just yeah. accept the majority's ruling and those who stand outside or opposed to it become the new black sheep or the ostracized people. So we need more people that are willing to come forward in their truth and hold and hold tight to that and bring up this cause for debate because at a mature level, debating looks like bringing facts and truth to the table. And we need that today in our society. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So the key components again you know when it, we, we're giving out a lot of information yeah. you can take your notes and you need to let 
it all starts to settle. But the key component is if you're stressed, learn to breathe, practice mindfulness, meditation, uh, brain entrainment, listen to frequency music, do some slow movements, slow your world right down. If you're angry, uncovering what's tr uh, triggering it, anger's often around feelings of being violated. And um, it was one of the key things I used to talk to young people at school about because anger was always seen as, you know, the, the, the bad thing. But actually, you know, if you buy a stereo and it breaks, you're going to get angry and the anger motivates you to go back to the shop, take the receipt and stand your ground and get your rights met. If you're anxious, do you fear life? You know, are you are you worried always about things that haven't happened yet? Are there things in the future that you think could happen? Anxieties, uh, you can have free floating anxiety, what you call existential anxiety, which is just anxiousness in the world. And other people be, can be anxious about a future that hasn't happened yet. So that's why bringing your attention back to yourself and being mindful and keep practicing that, bringing your energy back to yourself and your awareness back to yourself helps you develop uh, a better way of being in the present, self-trust and faith. If you feel stuck and lack of clarity, sometimes you just got to get out of your head. And Danielle's great for that with me because I am in my head a lot. I'm an analytical person. So when I started doing yoga and getting back into dance and, you know, in the past did a bit of Tai Chi uh, or arts, that helps you get out of your head. One of the other things uh, in the Chinese five elements yoga is stuckness can mean that you're in the wrong um element so you can be in wood and when you really need to bring some fire or you're in water and you need to bring some wood so sometimes shifting the practice especially if you're the sort of person that I used to be like when I went to the gym years ago would do the same thing every time you know I'd get stuck in this routine um, other issues uh, to just be mindful of is what kind of things are stopping you move forward so uh, and what are you avoiding what kind of and my, I have a rule if something comes up to me a few times it means it needs you need to pay attention to it so if you can't do it right now or you're in a crisis then you need to part that and pay attention uh, at some other stage so they're the sort of if we had a look at psychology and spirituality 101 uh, and the basics they would sort of be the basic premise now there's a lot of basics there but the basics in being human is you know, you need to eat, you need to breathe, you need you need some food in your system. And then often people need something in which to place their focus as well as you need uh, to be present. And your emotions are uh, your system, navigating system that helps you navigate the world and manage the incoming data. Uh, not always correct the data that's coming through, but um, Abraham Hicks talks a, a lot about this in the law of attraction, that your emotions uh, are for you to discern what's happening in your environment, unless you're in a crisis and then you've got that, you know, stegosaurus uh, who is growling at you, then you, you get up and run and you don't think about it. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, what I'm hearing from you is the beginning stages of Maslow's hierarchy of needs with that baseline, um, basic needs that you need food shelter water yeah so i'm just gonna draw that up because uh i really like this little graph so i mean maslow has been around a long time and he forms the basis really of how we think um about society and human beings and what we need and yet people might not realize that you, you can't always strive to have, say, like self-actualization if at the bottom of your needs, which is a physiological element of breath, food, water, sleep, homeostasis and, you know, the basic bodily functions. Um, that's really important. Um, so a lot of my projects have been about helping people. And it's quite difficult, actually, supporting people to uh, do personal development work and manage their mental health when they are trying to find somewhere to live, going to need some money and somebody else needs to uh, sort them out because you've got to prioritize. And if your jug is half empty, your energy has to go into those things. Once you've got that level of security, which interestingly, 
this one is red which links with the root chakra which brings that spiritual dimension into it is if you don't feel safe it affects the foundation of everything else so um then you need that aspect of uh, safety so that could be you know in terms of the the body or where you live or the employment um and having some regular income coming in the other aspects of Maslow's uh, idea, and there are many of these triangles around with slightly different variations of them, but the fundamental principles are the same, that these are all the aspects of being human. Um, we all need to feel a sense of love and belonging. Now, some of us like that sense of belonging more than others. We've got extroverts who like lots of people. We've got introverts who are happy with a few people and a few family members. And if those relationships are of quality, it brings uh, joy and happiness in, uh, into your life. And that's a very supportive factor. Um, we also need uh, some level of esteem. Uh, now, self-esteem is an interesting one, and there's been a lot written about that, but it really just is about having the steam in which to propel yourself forward and take risks and do new things and getting that sense of confidence so you can get some sense of achievement in whatever way. Now, whether or not you seek respect and uh, admiration by others, but respect is often a key feature with people and important to them. And right at the top is anyone on the personal development trail, uh, whichever, whichever model that you pursue uh, will be aiming for uh, self-actualization. And the way that um, Carl Rogers, who was fundamental to the human potential movement in the 60s and Abraham Maslow talks about it is human beings are meant to grow and change and Rogers talked about you know if you've got a potato in a sack uh, it's in the dark the moment that potato gets a shard of light roots start to grow it's just an innate feature of being human but if we're stuck at those other levels and the needs aren't being met a lot of mental health issues are around unmet needs and um self-actualization is also about knowing who you are what gifts you have and how you can utilize those in the world whether you monetize them or not so that's that sort of fundamental aspect of that so the way to use that is just look at that you can you know if you email us or you can go online and have a look at maslow's hierarchy of needs loads of these images come up and have a look is there any aspect of that where you think you're not getting some of those needs met and if so is that is that going to be something that can become a focus or are you spending too long or too much focus on one area so we've got the picture of the dollar bill i think it's dollar bill or it might be the queen's pound um you know if the focus is only on money but it's not on love and belonging and esteem then you can be out of balance so i don't know if anyone's got any questions about that uh, well, Danielle. Lauren made a valid point on here, and it says that a lot of Maslow gets influenced with how you're raised, she feels. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, because, and, and I think that's part of why we use this a lot in children's services, because, um, you know, if a child doesn't feel safe and hasn't got a sense of love and belonging, we know it will affect their esteem and their capacity to make friends and go through school and develop confidence and learn. So that's a really uh, useful point. Um, and then since we're finishing up on the hierarchy of needs, I will bring in the, the esoteric side of it, which is there is a really great website and I'm going to post it in the comments and it's called Labyrinthos. And if you just put in your search engine, Labyrinthos, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, it will pull up a, uh, a tarot spread for you. You can use Oracle cards, you can use tarot cards, you can combine them, whatever works for you. But that's another way to bring in um, your intuition, your, your higher self, your subconscious forward for you so that you can start working towards that, um, that, that hierarchy that is truly a foundation for what you need and who you are. Yeah, most definitely. And I, I just wanted to go back to Emily's point where we were talking um, about uh, the body. Um, she's exploring the avenue of fasting. Um, that's that's a route I've tried. And uh, there's a lot of research uh, around about how uh, 
we can get caught into having a particular diet, but actually what happens to the body and how it heals when there's no food in there because the energy is generated and, and supports the, the internal systems and clearing what's not needed. So um, it'd be great if Emily comes back at some stage. Uh, often we use the 30-day rule, give something a go. How's that gone on? And there's a lot of information on there, but it'd be good to see. Um, we could see how she gets on with that. Uh, okay. And so then Lauren did want to point out that the safety part is where a lot of people get um, caught up. So I want to go ahead and expand on that real fast. Um, yeah. So this is where it's really important to do our root chakra work. This is where it's really important to start being grounded within ourselves. Then the reason why is I, through my journey, I don't feel like I, I didn't feel like I had a safe place. I didn't have somebody I can turn to. I, the world was not, not a safe place for me. And it got to the point where even my home was being a consistent, not safe place for me. So I started with self. I became my own safe place. I trusted who I was. I trusted my guidance. I knew that I knew my truth, no matter what others said or thought or did towards me. And I really worked at becoming, um, this is root chakra work, where I really began to believe that I I was trusted enough to be my own safe place. And that really started catapulting me into the, the next step, that love and belonging, because once you're not trying to turn others into your safety, your safety net or to your rescue system, the quicker you're going to be able to see how love truly looks like and what safe places do feel like. That's a really good point. Thanks for that. Because, um, my pursuit of really reading a lot about what's happening in the spiritual community it is a key phenomenon that with the amount of trauma that people have experienced they also are not going to feel safe and part of the work is to create those safety mechanisms and get in the body and not disassociate and and trip out and that is a coping mechanism that serves a good purpose but yeah. that can then become a disruptor to uh, current or future relationships or you can be easily triggered we've all got our you know trigger spots but um it 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 can be slight things that derail you um and make some of the day-to-day -day things much more difficult than other people experience but it's perfectly normal and that's the thing with any of the information that i'm sharing is because we want to normalize your experience your sense of being in the world and give you the information so that you're able to see that some of these ideas have really been well explored because, um, you know, it, that information can then help you decide how can you use that for you? How can you put in factors that support your own self-care? And then how can you create a system around you, whether that's your house, your furnishings, uh, the things that you like to do that will help strengthen your own internal sen sense of safety? Sometimes our childhood issues don't ever completely disappear, but we don't have to be um, ruled by them forever. So that's Maslow. Is there any other questions we need to? Uh... No, I love this. Thank you guys so much. You're being very active in this conversation. Brilliant. And it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's really mm -hmm. kind of pulling out even more information for us. And I appreciate that. But I, I am yeah. excited to move into the cycle of change. Right. So one of the reasons, so when Danielle and I were talking about doing the workshop and also this webinar is, uh, and why we chose these models is because they, they kind of like the basic foundation in a lot of the psychological approaches and understanding where you are at in terms of Maslow's hierarchy and needs and what needs aren't being met are fundamental to your mental health and wellbeing. And, um, in, in one therapeutic approach in the UK, uh, the Human Givens Institute, where I did a lot of my uh, training, post-therapy uh, training, is they talk about mental health and exploring people's needs and their capacity to um, start making changes at that level can be massively uh, life-changing, yeah. even if you don't do any of the other stuff. But the other aspect of this is when you're in a funk and you get stuck, and like I said, there are different ways that you can help get out of that, or you're thinking of a change, 
People can be thinking of a change for years and never take any steps to do anything different. And other people can have an idea and turn it around and do something overnight. So this was sort of established in psychology as um, one of the tricky bits we have when you when you work as a therapist, a social worker, a life coach, is you've got people coming to you all the time that want that either you think need to do something different or they think they need something different because there's, and I'll say social work because they're the professionals I work with most at that time, um, often had an idea that if the parent did something different, then everything else, you know, would fall into place. However, uh, other people telling you that where you're at and you're not in a great place isn't necessarily uh, the most helpful thing to do. So what psychologists started doing this, uh, Prochaska uh, came up with this idea that the, that we're in cycles and when Danielle and I are talking, we often talk about cycles, whether they're moon cycles, you know, system cycles, the wheel of fortune cycle, the, you know, that we go around these cycles and some of them can be quite small and some can be really big. So um, it's thinking about if you have a change, the easiest way to think about is when you've made a change. So if you're in a change at the moment or you're thinking about something, it's sort of sometimes hard to work out where you're at. But so if you sort of park what you want and the problem for a moment or, or the direction of travel you want and you think about what change have you made in the past and uh, and it can be a pivotal change. How long were you thinking about it, but you had no intention of making any changes or changing the behavior or how long had you contemplated it? You knew there was a problem because pre-contemplation sort of means you don't really know it's a problem, but everyone else might be telling you there is. Uh, so the key one in that is addictions um and the next one is contemplation you're aware there's a problem but you've no commitment to it the next one preparation is where you start to think okay i think of so going back to emily's uh, she wants she's uh, doing something around the fasting it may be that she's been thinking about that or uh, maybe had no thoughts about diet but then started contemplating that and then was prepping for that. So you do your research and you meet people and you go for meetings and you go for peer support and then you make some action. And then it's what what is it you're modifying, what you're doing differently? So the thing, say, like with diet is everybody does this every year, every Christmas, uh, New Year. P people eat loads at Christmas. We all want to lose weight in New Year. And the average people last is seven days before they go back to the same part of the cycle, because maintenance is one of the toughest thing. So what I'd advocate is if you want to make any changes in your life, choose one thing. Don't choose everything at the same time. If you've never been in a gym and you want to work out and you've uh, and your level of fitness isn't great, getting off the sofa is an action. Getting off the sofa, putting your trainers on is an action. You can do that for a week. Getting off the sofa, putting your trainers on and going into the gym and working out for five minutes are all actions. If you go into the gym and work out for two hours, get really shattered, um, that's going to be, uh, that's going to affect you and it's going to be difficult to take the next step. So you've got to be really realistic. So whenever we're meeting people and we start to do any kind of change work, and this is probably quite common with life coaches because life coaches want you to be ready for change. They want you with your goals and want you to, uh, to tell them how you're going to meet those goals. Whereas this sits within general psychology and, and in therapy work. So when you're in maintenance, what helps you sustain that change and new behavior? One of the key things that is emergent is consistency. So like the five second rule, if you're procrastinating, you can't get out of bed and you're sluggish all the time, set yourself a goal of getting out of bed in five seconds and doing five minutes of stretching every day. Do that for 30 days. When you start to see the benefit of that, it's the benefits that help you maintain it. It's the outcome of the behavior. Um, don't be looking for motivation because your motivation can slip within a few weeks. And then you've got relapse where you fall back into that old behavior. Um, so I don't know if you've got something you can think of, Danielle, but I know, uh, OK, one thing I'm not really meant to eat as part of my diet, if I'm thinking about maintaining a healthy diet, which I tend to do most of the time, two things that I can end up having, uh, but one of them in particular is not good for me, is bread. And I love toast. I've got a soft spot for it. You know, so my relapse is if I eat it, <laughs> it's, it's like a strong drug for me. I then want to eat it every day. If I stop eating it and I don't touch it for weeks, 
I tend to not relapse. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so we can, we can, that's a very simple way of looking at before I looked at diet, I kind of knew there was something and I contemplated it. I put some plans in place and I chose the method I wanted to take, you know, or the, that can be physical or anything. And then it's, how do you sustain that? So you can look at this in changes you've made, or you can look at this with the change that's coming up. So, but the point is, that's it's up to you it's your prerogative you can change or not change you can stay exactly the same and if you want um in-depth uh in-depth conversation about the cycle of change we actually have that posted under podcasts in our youtube and it's episode 19 and it's literally the cycle of change so if you guys want to go in more in depth with that, um, on a free podcast, please feel free to get onto episode 19, take a look at it. It'll expand upon this cycle of change in a little deeper of a way for you, how we've worked through our personal cycle of change and how we've witnessed others doing the same. Yeah. So again, it, you know, it, it's a simple, but can be complex model, but, um, where it can be useful in your own life. If you're not working in the field of helping, um, I'm, I'm talking about healers, yoga teachers, all sorts of people. Um, you can look at it in terms of your relationships, your friendships. So if you've got somebody around you that, you know, uh, has something they want to change, like uh, in their lifestyle or in terms of getting a new job and they're always complaining about it, then on if you understand this, it stops you getting so caught out And professionals that talk to clients also have behavior change methodology and questions that they can ask that helps shift you into the next stage. We've got services in the UK that help people stop smoking and they use this model all the time. So that's the cycle of change. And again, thinking about where are you, if there's a change you want to make, those questions that I ask you, and then how you can think about where am I? And if you relapse, if it's the same thing, you relapse a lot, it can be a past program or it can be a belief system or some behaviors have what they call a secondary gain. There's a payoff to it or it can have a payoff to somebody else. So one of the things I I saw a lot when I was training as a therapist, there was 17 of the women on the course and they were starting to grow and develop. Some partners really struggle to see their partners grow and develop because they feel threatened. They might have passed Maslow's hierarchy of needs, trust issues or uh, issues with change and something evolving. And they might make it very difficult for those partners. Some of those relationships fell apart and some of them got stronger because you take it to a new cycle Mm -hmm. of relating. But that was a very common one with um, trainees at the time that I was seeing. So uh, I think that's the cycle of change. Right, so now we're going to the wellbeing wheel and there are a lot of these wheels and I think the picture's a little bit big. Let me make it smaller. Okay, so if you imagine you draw a circle in your journal and you put these segments in it, so you've got, and you can put different things in the segments, but these are the sort of common ones you'll have work spiritual relationships social uh emotional environmental intellectual you could have work on there there's all sorts uh i think i put a second one on here actually uh social environmental spiritual intellect oh yeah that's similar so what you do is you draw a wheel and if you imagine right at the center of the wheel where it's got henry co is a, a zero And going out to the edge of the wheel is a 10. So, um, Danielle, if I said to you, choose a segment and you mark it, 10 is absolutely satisfied with that area of your life and zero is not, what would you mark in terms of uh, one of those segments? Which segment would it be? Okay, so I'm going to go with a a segment that I am um, still uh, working through because it wouldn't be fair to everybody for me to um, 
pick spiritual or well, tell me the one yeah tell me the one that you're happy with and what number you give it because okay think so if we're on a scale of one to ten and i'm going with spirituality i'm going to say i am sitting somewhere between a 9.5 and 10 i would only say 9.5 because there's always more to learn and more to be great grateful or in gratitude for okay so you've got spiritual uh in your wheel what's the next segment that you'd like to choose um, let's see, let's go to occupational. So what does that mean to you? Occupational to me is going to mean my kind of like my satisfaction of where I am in career, where I am in, um, my personal needs for if they're being met towards the position that I'm going for in a career aspect. Okay. So where are you in that aspect? Number I would between- say- I would say I'm sitting somewhere, I I would, today I would say a seven, um, which would have just pushed it up from a six just this past week. Yeah. Okay. So you said it pushed, pushed it up from a six to a seven. That's a really good point because you can score a six or a five in any of those aspects. And then the next question is, how would you, what number do you want it to be? And how would you get it there? So what moved it from a, 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 a six to a seven for you? Um, action moved it from a six to a seven for me. We went from something being, uh, getting ready to do to, I learned new skills, technical skills to get myself pushed forward so that we could come on here in a live aspect through another platform. So that to me tells me that I am capable more than I've been giving myself credit for in the more technical sides of the career that I am, I am going after. And, and Danielle, by the way, has done amazingly well in that. I've been uber impressed. Um, <laughs> uh, with the technical, she's surpassed me on that in many ways this week. So um, so that takes it to a seven. Your ideal number would be? Um, somewhere between nine and 10, just because I know perfection is unattainable. So I would like to sit um, on a consistent level at nine that I'm very proud of the work I'm doing. I'm pr- very proud of what I'm pushing forward. Okay, so everyone else on this call, if you've got your um, journal, I've taken it. I don't know if you can, yeah, can you see that? So I've just drawn a very basic circle and I've put the segment that Danielle talked to me about, which was the spiritual, 9.5, and I put the career and I've num- I marked six that moved it to seven and then we started asking that question. So you can do the same on your well-being wheel and it can be any section. So if you choose a third section and what, what you wanna do guys is mark between naught and 10 and 10 is how satisfied are you? So now what we're doing is we're, we're breaking down the structure of your life into these areas. So what would be the third one, Danielle? Um, let's see, uh, let's go with physical. Okay. What number would you score that at? Um, can I do half numbers or do you want me to stay in the, in the solids? You can do whatever you like. I love it. I I would say a 7.5 for the physical with a goal of being at nine. Okay. So that's how you do it. This is how you use the wheel. So the physical yours would be a nine. So, um, then if I was working with Danielle further on her wheel, anyone who's looking at that, what you then do is you mark it out for each one. So anyone who's listening, think about the one that you score in the highest at the moment and why it's that number. What makes it that number? What's good about that? And and uh, and, and celebrate that. Celebrate yeah. that you've got it in that uh, area because yeah. believe me, I've worked with a lot of people and they sc- can score really low in those areas so give me an area where you might score it quite low oh goodness I, you well, know not that you, you might not have a low one so I, I don't what I would like to do is go ahead and give because I've been on this journey and I've really taken this you know things like this well-being will seal seriously I yeah. If we have any volunteers from the audience that would like to um, score pick one of the t- one of the pieces of the will and then score it and send it to us um, in this chat or even I'm checking private messages as well in my uh, if you're on my Facebook um, and that way we can uh, possibly bring you forward otherwise I'm going to have to give a little bit of a not full truth (laughs) yeah that's okay because role play um, it's role play yeah it's good 
Okay, and we're, we have a, uh, we have a delay between where we are and what, yeah, what are, what are you two people are getting? Okay. So I'm going to give it just a second. All right. I'm not really seeing anything yet. So, oh, perfect. Okay. So Taya says physical that she's at a two. Right. Okay. Taya. So I'm going to use Danielle's wheel as well. So we have a two. So what you know, you need to think about is when you're looking at that, what makes it a two? So is it that you're not doing as much exercise as you think, or you're very tired all the time and you know that exercise could help you. And these are just some things to consider and then consider what number you want it to be. So the next step is what is one small thing you could do this week and over the coming weeks that would move that slightly up to a three. So if you want to, if you're happy to share that, that'd be great. In the meanwhile, um, how would you, uh, Danielle, move yours further up in terms of physical? What extra one thing could you do every day or a couple of times a week, whichever way? Absolutely. For me, I need to get more into my physical body through something like Tai Chi or yoga. Um, I feel like that, that type of physicality for me really brings me back to, to my body and allows me to, um, move forward with it. Okay. So what is a realistic goal? Cause it has to be realistic. You can't, well, you could, you could do Tai Chi every day for an hour, but what would be realistic? Well, for me, it would probably, I would say that somewhere between 10 to 20 minutes per day for me to stay focused on the physical and the energy that's moving around the physical. If we're talking Qi Kong or Tai Chi would be the most um, important way for me to, to level that up, making it a daily, uh, almost as if, you know, that the morning ritual that I do, you know, it only takes five to 10 minutes, but it really refocuses me. So if I could spend that same amount of time harnessing my physical body and the energy around it, then I feel like I could easily take that up a step. Okay. So at this point, what I could be saying to Danielle, if we were working privately is, okay, so you are signing up to doing at least five or 10 minutes a day, for example, mm -hmm. and you'll do that every day now um for 30 days but you can review after seven days and see are you doing enough or do you want to change it so but the whole point is to shift the mindset out of what you're currently doing to add something additional check it out like the scientist and see how that's worked for you and one of the reasons I get up every morning and do I, I set myself a goal of 10 minutes of yoga. I always do more, but 10 minutes is realistic. And when I finish at 10 minutes, if I want to, I feel good. If I set myself a goal of an hour and I finished at 10 minutes, I wouldn't feel good. So it's like, that's why I'm talking about realistic goals. Right. So right. Danielle could be setting that goal and doing that. So Taya's got back to us. Yes. It's yeah. more about sleep and love it to be an eight. I'd love to be more motivated to move your body. So yeah, Daniel? this is a good one, guys. You, we, this, this little, that tricky word called motivation. This is, this is perfect. Mel has the best description for this. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not, well, it's a little bit of a myth motivation. We can start off with motivation and really going back to Mel Robbins five second rule is you've just got to decide you're going to do it. And as I know that sounds easy, but, um, what you, you could think about how you want to move your body. Do you mean like you want to walk through the forest or do you want to dance in the kitchen? Um, because you can, you can break that down if you wanted to move your body more and set yourself a goal of one minute every hour, you know? Yeah. Five minutes every hour. I boil the kettle. It takes three minutes. I do stretches while the kettle's on. You know, I do stretches while I'm cooking. By the time I've finished making a couple of uh, cups of coffee, I've done five stretches. Then I can just do my usual yoga. And I've got so in the habit of that, that I've got to be careful what, not to do it when I go around someone else's house. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny. Now, I did want to, I want to sidetrack for just one second. And one of the people said that they would rate their intellectual at four. I would have to beg the question of perception. Um, for that, just because I know this person personally, that I feel like this is a perceived, um, for, and not a realistic for. And so I want to, 
allow that to open up to you guys to know that sometimes the way we perceive ourselves isn't the mm-hmm. truth. And the way that we see um, where we are, like in the physical too, um, you know, we'd be amazed at how many steps we take a day. My husband has um, one of those little watches that that will mark oh, your, yeah. your steps and stuff. And we've learned these little things like walking from one side of my house to the other is 60 steps. Right. So you do that a few times, you're starting to add to your steps, even if you're not doing anything that day. If you walk to the backyard or if you walk outside to the bottom of your apartment complex and take a quick walk around the block and come back in, you've already got some physical movement inside. So just remember that sometimes what we are perceiving as the truth, as the number system is going to change as we start to realize that we start getting that empowerment. We start changing that perspective. We stop feeding the environmental nastiness into our, into our constant feed. We're going to start to see that like, maybe I'm smarter than I am. Maybe I am more physical than I originally thought I was. Maybe this is all just been a perception of mine. So I did want to bring that forward. I think you're right. And often, um, you know, the perception is laid down in early foundations and yes, school if you can't meet whatever the teacher perceives is, you know, what you should be learning. And certainly when I was working in schools, we learned that there were different, I think there were seven intelligences because you can have musical intelligence, you can yeah. have spatial intelligence. So it's not just one type of intelligence and the IQ test um, yeah. hasn't really been challenged in the way that it should. So no, um, we're not asking fish to climb a tree. <laughs> I love your phrase. When I'm you telling that. you, like you can have a monkey get in the, in the, in the river with a fish and the fish is going to outswim the monkey, but you ask that fish to climb the tree. It's not going to be able to do it. It doesn't make that fish stupid. No. And, and so if you're struggling, I, what I did notice with uh, young people at school, they could be really good at English, like writing stories and things like that, but really struggle at math. Um, and I could see people who were really sporty, who were, who struggled in say religious education, you know, because it's, it's the different thinking processes that are required. But the reason I pulled up this other wheel is it starts to look at some very simple things you can do because um Whoever wrote that, you know, before I went to um, study this work that I'm doing, I sort of drifted out at school at 14 because of what I was seeing. I struggled with some of the lessons and I didn't really have a good sense of my own abilities. But when I found subjects that I enjoyed, I just, you know, initially I only took up a six week course that turned into four years. It was six weeks, a year, a year, then two years. And I, I read a lot as a kid and then I had a break, but then I started reading psychological books. Then I started thinking about how that psychology linked to me. And then I started having conversations about it, but it can be anything, history, whatever, because, you know, I'm rubbish in general, um, what do you call those uh, quiz quizzes that they do in pubs? I don't know if you have them in America. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about the the useless knowledge quiz, <laughs> general knowledge. Yeah, useless knowledge. <laughs> yeah, I'm not very good at them because I'm quite focused on a particular couple of areas, and everything I read and and what I explore is along the lines of, you know, what I've been covering over the years. But it, it makes me happy and it gets me at a nine as well so it could be that you read a book it might be that you do a mini course but you've got to work out like what Danielle says um what is the what is that is that a perception and is it that these are messages that you got from other people Uh, because if you're functioning in society you've got a level of intellect um because you've got to have a level of intellect right youtube and facebook um (laughs) And now, and would you laptop. fall back into the Maslow's hierarchy of needs once you've reached this space and you say, hey, I think maybe I've been conditioned to believe yeah. that I'm a two or a four in whatever this department is. And maybe if I go back to this Maslow hierarchy of needs, I can start to adjust there. Yeah, exactly. So again, it's this is the early messages we received. And it may well be that you flunked or didn't do well in one area um and you've uh, ingrained some messages about that and I certainly did because I struggled in some subjects but I was highly musical and um really uh, gifted in terms of 
what we used to have social studies and stuff. And of course, that's what I ended up uh, developing in a different way. And that then meant I could generate knowledge and understanding. But it's only big, it's only got big because you want to do it. And that's the thing. So have a look at this wheel. And it just comes out with some very simple things like if you want to develop your uh, physical, it says exercise regularly. I mean, that's open into a, uh, to interpretation. Break that down into what that might look for you. Keep these steps simple rather than... Um, Rather than setting yourself up, um, I had a friend once going back to the physical and I walked past her every day when I was at work. And she used to say, because I was going to the gym all the time and I used to have a desk full of herbal dictionaries and health and well-being food and all of that. And she used to walk past her or I'd walk past her and she'd say, I really need to go for the, to the gym. And, and after a few months of this, I said, we'll go to the gym. <laughs> 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 you know and then I said well what's stopping you and then we had a chat about what it was and I said look you don't need to go to the gym and if you haven't been to the gym it can be really daunting yes because either how you think you look or you, you just haven't stepped in there and you're not confident so I said I tell you what to do set yourself three exercises every day that you can do for 30 days do you know what? Within two weeks, she was exercising at home. Yeah. So what it is, you know, back to that original question of the, the, how do I get motivation? The, the secret to motivation is doing yeah. just fighting again, like everything else we are always ever going to describe to you. It's you have to walk through the fear to get to the, to, to the, the gift, to get yeah. to the present, to get walking through the fire, to reach that understanding to that gift. And this is how the only way, cause I have suffered from lack of motivation, you know, uh, for a lot of things in my life, but it was just the understanding that there's not a motivation key. The key is just to do, and then motivation follows suit. And that is what we really have to enforce in this guardian brain of ours. And this ego brain of ours is that there's not a magical fix that it just by doing just by stating, I am worthy enough to do this. Yeah than just doing it. And then the motivation yeah. begins to follow. So going back to some of the other tools that you can use to get to know yourself, one thing to be mindful of, if we look at life as a continuum, say you're really active or you're not active, is what you've got to be mindful of is if you set yourself a goal, set yourself a goal that is realistic and that you can review and see how you feel your you're running on that goal. If you're starting to experience health problems and your blood work is showing something, then it means that you, you need to ramp up some maybe the things that you do on the goal. But also understanding your own psychology because I have what they use. I don't know if they're still using this term in, in psychology actually, but I had a type A personality, which meant I would do 200% of everything. And so what happened is when I started going to the gym, I would go to the gym, even if I was exhausted and my legs were hanging off and I would still go to the gym because it was a pattern I'd created and one, and, and you do get the endorphins and everything that's running through. So mm -hmm. I've had to learn from my own personal psychology to have really low down periods as in just chilling out sitting in the sun playing some music and not doing it so you've got to look at your life in terms of the balance if you're doing a lot of things and one of the things that can help is just looking at your week and thinking what one thing can I do that will help me on the financial the social the environmental the spiritual the intellectual and it could be Monday, you read a book, Tuesday, you go for a walk, Wednesday, you take the dog out, yeah. Thursday, you meet your friends, Friday, you speak to a financial advisor or look at your debt management or something. And Saturday, you sit down because you've got a bit long and you get your journal out and you go, why was I so angry at, you know, uh, Mrs. Bloggs who lives down the road? Or I think I'm going to research what counseling organizations are around right now and set it as your plan of like a goal a day. Um, if you're not used to doing this, when we are, when we're in the workshop, we'll be getting spending a lot more time over this for people because we can trip ourselves up with stories, yeah. with narratives, with why we should or shouldn't. We should get fit because we should look like the models on Instagram, you know. Right. And and, and that's part of a look. separate healing journey, but it all relates to this. And this is the perfect opportunity to tell you my favorite. It's kind of smart ass, so just still. <laughs> It's called the KISS method and it's keep it simple, stupid. 
we come, we make everything complex. The more we simplify what it is that we need in life, the easier things are going to come. Don't let the ego, the guardian trick you into thinking it needs to be more complex than it is because truly the keep it simple, stupid method, the kiss method takes us to a simplistic form format where everything you just do out of its simplicity. And in that simplicity is where this really deep, difficult work starts to push through and allows itself to heal because we are keeping things simple and we're not over make, over complicating anything in our life. And every time you catch yourself complicating something, something, take yourself back to the kiss method, make yourself laugh that it says, keep it simple, stupid, because it's hilarious. It really checks you. It really makes you say, maybe I am my own biggest hurdle, my own biggest obstacle. Maybe if I just simplified this and this, I could work through it and manage it in an easier way. Yeah, exactly. And um, Taya, just going back to yours about procrastination is, um, it's a word that comes through often more times with writers and creatives and this idea that you should just be able to sit there and pull out a book you know and write 10,000 words in one go but some of the people that I've um, explored in that line of work will set themselves a goal where they sit down every day initially writing 200 words and you just write 200 words and you get up and you leave it and what happens is is going back to the brain and the neural pathways is your brain gets a different message now rather than sitting there and berating yourself and going, why can't I do this? Because the other aspect of that is if you haven't got this balance in your life and you're not getting out and having some nature and you're not getting enough sleep and you're not getting the right new food and you're not laughing and all of that, it doesn't really give the soul and the spirit the nourishment and nurturing it needs That's for, the right. in, for the insight and inspiration to come. And one of the reasons I struggle to practice meditation now is because all the creative ideas come in because I've been practicing it so long it's not just about still in the mind is actually that's where I get a lot of my insight and it's not been written about much there's one book where I found that um so it's the balance and it's being kind to yourself and going I'm only going to do like you know these things in these ways on this day as my starting point and I'll see how I get on and I'll, I'll and I'll look at it like as a curious person and and then I'll go, okay, well, you know, what? I could do 10 minutes. Like I said, with my 10 minute yoga, it's normally 40 minutes. But right. I get into it. But if I set myself a goal of getting up and doing 40 minutes, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> See, and weird. that's exactly the point. You know, the, the more we simplify it, the more we can exceed our own goals. Yeah. And, you know, then there's that reminder not to guilt and shame. If you don't reach the goal initially, just to recognize that this is where you're at, accept it. And then set that goal to where it's at so that you can then come back and amaze yourself when you raise that goal. Exactly. So I've done a really crude um, drawing of, can you see that, Danielle? I can see that. Okay. So that's just how you can write up your week and you can think about your wellbeing wheel and you can put something on each day in a section and just... If your brain works like mine, that can work better so that you manage your stress and you don't get overwhelmed. So on, so I have a day where I just do my photography. I have a day where I research yoga um, and I have a day where I make sure I get out and, and, and go in nature. And it's not like that every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but it just means I've got some of the basics down. And if you're running yeah. a house and you've got kids and all of that, it stops you feeling like you're only ever giving to other people and you're only ever, you know, cleaning the house or something like that so um in the meantime for anybody that's been on this today when we next do the webinar if you're able to feed back on the maslow's hierarchy needs the emotional uh, the well-being wheel any of the little things you put in and then if you faltered and you learned something about that because it's all a journey you know we're not looking at the destination then share that because these things are really helpful to other people to understand so I don't know, is there any other questions? Uh, simplification. Uh, <laughs> do you, uh, Emily, do you mean on the laptop you have 20 tabs open? No, she means in her brain laptop. <laughs> oh, right, because I do both. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so does my husband. I don't know how you guys do it. <laughs> 
right. but it is definitely a sign of intelligence and a, a working and yes. a magnificent creative brain if it's keeping 20 tabs open at a time, you know, I know that we fall into these labels of things like ADHD or any other neurodivergent experience, but I would say that there is a key inside of those experiences that really allow you to perform under levels that other people would break in. So I would use the, the things that we have in neurodivergence and really take those and create gifts, gifts from them. You the other aspects of that as well, Emily, what can happen is if you're quite a philosophical person, you're so interested in everything, you know, yes. one of the reasons I've got 20 tabs open because I'm reading all, all those different things at the same time. And yeah. I want to read about this new thing in yoga and I want to, I'm so curious and interested. I, that's why I created a structure because my brain was at risk of exploding and I felt that on some days. And so what I had to do is then structure it over the course of the months as well what is it I really want to explore and learn about right now and then okay take myself off the hook and then what can I find out more and that's how Danielle and I approach doing the podcast we we got absolutely overwhelmed like <laughs> all the tabs open of ah! all the different platforms <laughs> didn't we? So it's like what do we need to do right now and what can we focus on for a week yes and you could say to yourself I'm going to read you know a book in two weeks but I'm going to start thinking about that next program that next course at that next phase and then what you're doing is you're staging your own phases that gives you a sense of more empowerment and raises your self-esteem because you're managing that because if you keep the 20 tabs open all the time what you get is you get brain overload and um you might find that you just either have moments where you completely like you have to switch off or you have to find another mechanism for coming out of that because it's it's quite powerful and it is uh part of the sort of downside of having really good levels of intellectual yeah. capacity. It is, but that's the beauty. I mean, like every, every light has its shadow and that's its shadow. And it's our job to overtake as much of that shadow as we can <laughs> to move ourselves forward. It's okay to feel overwhelmed on some days. That's just letting you know you're doing too much and you need to sit in a hanged man position so that you can allow this information to come through and discern what is important and is what, what is not. And I love that all of these things that we're doing, they naturally carry over into the next, because what you've just done is to explain to people a way to take their daily work and make it into a timeline and how you can structure your life. Whenever you're first starting out in this process into timeline and how the timeline can affect us, how we're feeling and what lessons we can learn from that timeline. Yeah. So do you want to move into that or did you have more on that? Will the coaching will? No, I just, uh, if everyone's drawn the wheel and while I'm just pulling up the timeline, now what I'm going to do is I did this with Danielle and we could do it with someone on the call. I'm going to show someone something, uh, the main type of timeline, but how you can use timeline in your day-to-day to to see how your emotions are interfering in the advancements or the the work-life balance that you've got. So because the longer timeline, when people next come on a call or come to the workshop, that alone you can you can spend and probably do need to spend a really good amount of time on it because that's where you really start to see the programs the patterns and the emerging cycles um so i'm going to introduce people to it today if they've not seen it and i'm going to go through the daily timeline to look at how people see how we fluctuate as well yeah and we do have a volunteer for that timeline for you okay cool um so i might ask the volunteer to help me on the day one um and poss- once they've got a grasp of that and then anyone who wants to do the longer um the the long one is basically your life so life on right the and that's something that we will be more in depth with during the workshop as it does take up a lot of time and space yeah for people. Um, um, and some of what we've talked about today is like the prep work so that when you come into a workshop you've already set off those fired off those neurons neurons and we've entertained some concepts where we can say what did you do what did you learn where are you at and you can have more of a realistic view of that and and of what what's working what isn't working what trips you up so um in terms of what is timeline 
uh, timeline therapy or timeline work actually comes from a hip hypnotic approach uh, created by NLP. NLP is neuro linguistic programming. Um, a lot of people are trained in that, but they tend to use it in business because neuro is the way the brain works. Linguistic is the language we use and the programming is exactly that. So what they look at is how language and patterns in the brain create these programs. So Tad James, who uh, was a master at NLP, created this timeline therapy using NLP practices. Um, which is uh, processes, which is basically a model that when you look at your timeline, there's things on there, like I said earlier, where you can bring resources, skills and abilities forward into the now that you might have forgotten about or not realised were of value. But you can also look at some of the marks in your timeline from birth to now as to uh, where you would score, like we've just did, out of 10, a plus 10 or a minus 10. So the minus 10 is like how detrimental or difficult or so if we looked at, say, loss, uh, someone significant, you might mark that as a minus eight. It was a mark in your timeline that you never quite got over at that point. Um, and there might be something in the plus 10 where you got the job of your dreams and other things can go on there. And this is where you start to build up your narrative and you, the sort of what's the story of your life. So Tad James created it. And it has been used as a therapy, but you can, I just use it as a way of looking at certain aspects of my life. Cause you can have a look at what's your timeline of relationships. What's your timeline of work? What's your timeline of friendships? And that's where, if you draw it down and I'll show you in a minute how uh, you can do that, but it's where um, the reason that they use the sort of hypnosis approach in it is most of the in information is stored within the subconscious that only really comes up when we're tr triggered or we are feeling safer in life. When we're feeling safer in life, that's when the body sort of can release what it's been holding on to, which is why when things go in well, sometimes people can feel worse um, for short time periods. Um, and it will, help, it will help examine limited beliefs. I don't deserve it. I can't do it. I'm not good enough. Um, so it will help unpack that. So if you looked at this as a sort of... Um, process of thinking about the timeline if you think about where you are right now and how old you are and you go right back to when you were born between birth and now you've had lots of experiences some of those experiences have, have stuck with you because they were like really positive um and some experiences stuck with you but were really negative now as in trauma it affects people in different ways and has a different uh leaves a different trace so but there could be one or two things that um appear if you think about it and you think yeah so one way to work with the timeline is to sort of understand but we don't the, the thing is danielle and i are helping people to think about the positive aspects of life and and how you improve more of that but at the same time we don't want to ignore the shadow so you can use the timeline to write OK, wh wh what was your best holiday and what was your best job and what relationship was the best and what other events were great? And you put them on. So if you have like my little stick man, because uh, I like stick man and you have a look at uh, the beginning of your life, you just draw a line like that. And then you have the stick man at the end. And I've got some uh, statements in there. What was the event? How did you perceive it? What happened? What did you learn and what emotions are uh, associated with that? So it could be the event, me and Danielle could have the same event, but we've got a complete different experience and different emotions. And then on the uh, side of the paper, it's got plus 10 and minus 10. And this is where you can start to map out. Now, like I say, I'm introducing the idea to you because um, time isn't necessarily linear. But um, one thing I noticed when I had my car accident is all the other accidents and trauma and experiences I had came up in my mental uh, experience like a washing line. And it was literally like someone had uh, put on the washing line pictures of every one of those experiences. And I knew the process was is that you can have an experience now and anything that's similar to that on the same frequency um, if we're looking at it from spiritual terms, psychological terms, it, it, it's pattern matching. So the patterns are similar, is it enough similarity? 
then that can come up. That's why we feel in crises and flooded sometimes because too many things have come up together. So you just draw a simple timeline and in your spare time, and I, I would do it on a different day to you doing all the um, well-being wheel and looking at your Maslow's hierarchy needs because this alone, you could sit there for two hours on a Saturday morning listening to some music and thinking, if you're struggling with relationships, for example, you could just put all your significant relationships in there, mother, father, um, any uh, relationships you've had, you know, uh, since you started uh, seeing people till now. So, but what can happen is um, those events, as it's put on that um, chart there, will have what's called an emotional tag. So as I made reference earlier to the table in the living room, that hasn't got an emotional tag, So, but we've got a memory of it. So what timeline therapy does, it uses hypnosis uh, to go into, uh, to bypass the mental mind, to go into the subconscious so that you can revisit those, but from a third person experience. Yeah. So you're not re-entering the emotion and start to use clearing methods. Now, other, other therapies and healers use clearing methods um, with people and they can be effective. Um, but again, this is something you can do for you because if you were doing the timeline and you started to look across it, you might feel sad, you might feel emotional, you might feel regrets. So you write that down. And when you start to write it down, it starts to allow the process of you just going, wow, yeah, that happened. And part of acceptance, then what you move in yourself towards is self-compassion and radical acceptance. Mm -hmm. And they are very, very healing processes in, in the mental health system in the UK. Now they've moved to these models of enabling people to go towards being compassionate to themselves and radical acceptance. We can't change it. We can't do anything about it, but how, if there may be some lessons to learn, sometimes there aren't. And what can we take from that? But we have to take the tag out of that emotion because it's been, uh, it's been powerful. And that's why I said when we're doing any workshops, because Danielle can set up, you know, some of the grounding um, exercises, uh, some of the clearing methodology, we can play frequency music that helps clear that. And we can help create a safe space so that people can share any of those aspects and, and as a group you can help people move through that yeah um, sometimes it's one event and and that is it you know teacher shouted at you when you were 10 years old and you were never able to stand up in front of people and that is one of the common things that they do in NLP is you can't stand up on a stage because somebody humiliated you in front of people and um, therefore you've got to then work on the emotional imprint of that the memory doesn't go but the emotion behind it loosens. And then with all your other practices, you just go, okay, you know, this has been part of my human experience. And I'm not trying to underplay. Some people have had some horrendous experiences, but it's about not being a victim to them yep. and using and moving on from that. So that is something to do in your spare time. And if you've any questions with that, you can email Daniel and I in our, you know, email address. Um, and we can all always set up another group just to help people work through that. But um, it, it's safer to have a sort of closed circle so people can look at it. But you can get so much benefit out, out of using something like that in the interim. You can even play some healing music, decent, like uh, ethical music on YouTube and play that while you're working through the timeline. Ask your higher, your guides to help uh, help you in that process it may be that images come to you and you ask for the help in clearing that there are several methods I don't know if there's anything on that as well Danielle that you want to add no I you describe the timeline better than I ever could attempt so I, I don't I don't oh. attempt with that okay brilliant so um, what I want to introduce people to now is your day timeline so this is something I used to use with young people all the time um, in particular, if you're using language like, like always, forever, um, uh, quite uh, absolute language, then doing this day exercise uh, is in particular uh, useful. So um, I think we had, uh, Taya was going to um, join us for this. So I'm going to show you how we use it. 
So the same thing, you mark on your line, but you imagine that, so think of, say, yesterday, and mark plus 10 and minus 10, like you do on the, on the birth to now timeline. So you just want a line like that, okay? Then you start in your first point when you wake up, and your first point could be 7 o'clock in the morning. So I would put 7 a.m., so you mark out of 10 plus 10 or minus 10. How did you feel when you woke up? Um, so if I was doing this myself, I might say, okay, I felt, felt a bit tired or I wasn't feeling too great. So I might put uh, a two at 7 a.m. Then I might say by 11 o'clock. So I used to use this in terms of the lessons in schools. How did you feel? Well, I might be an eight. And then by 12 o'clock, I'm hungry. How do you feel? Well, this was before I ate, so I felt a two because I'm starving. And then I, uh, let's put the eight there. Oops, eight. And then two. And then by three o'clock, which is often the time people are going to pick up the children from school, then how do you feel? Well, you might have dipped. You might have saw someone that, has been causing arguments for you so you might have a minus five so you put that there and that's at 3 p.m okay so what you start to get are these time points in your day and then you put the emotion so you go at that time what did i feel and you put the emotion next to it then the next step is early evening so if you've had an argument with somebody and then you might think actually i'm still a minus five so um, I'm going to put it like that. So this is how you can start to use it. And then you start to realize when you look at that, that your day fluctuates in terms of your emotions. So what, how are you when you wake up? You do a body scan. How are you at 11 o'clock? How are you at 12? How are you at three? How are you at seven? How are you before you go to bed? If you did this every day for a week, you would start to see um, how your day fluctuates, how your mood fluctuates, what creates that? Is it related to particular people? Is it related to the job that you're doing, the activities? What brings you up and what brings you down? And sometimes that's external and sometimes it's internal. I, I mean, a lot of it is about what we think. So um, I think if I come off here, if everyone can see me, let me come out of this one a minute stop share right so so what you want to do is something similar so think about your day and think about the time points and then think about what you felt what the emotion was and again if we were doing this as a group i'd be able to um share with all of you and you'd all get to swap. So if you sent pictures in to me and Daniel, for example, then we might see that quite a few time points are minus five, or you're living on a high all the time and you're like an eight throughout the day because you've got a job you love, you love driving around, um, anything like that. So I'm going to let you do that and give you five minutes. And this will be, uh, there's a couple of things we're going to cover, but this will be one of the last things that we do today. Okay. So, so, what, yeah. so now we're moving into, because we're going to come revisit this, correct? Is what you were yeah. saying? Okay, perfect. So, so uh, I don't know if we had someone that was going to just share what their- We do. Um, we do. Um, Taya offered to volunteer for this one. So whenever Taya is yeah. ready, Taya, you're more than welcome to um, take a picture of that and send to, um, you can send it to my messenger or okay. whatever, and then I'll be able to share that with Mel and we can go over it. We won't show it on this screen for, you know, for, you know, obviously for personal reasons, but, um, we will go over it together. So with that being said, you know, while we're working on our timeline, I also wanted to hand out a little homework for people and um, something that could really help you get a grasp on what your story is, what, how you're going to tell your story 
And it allows you to kind of see who you are inside of this, um, of this world. And are you stepping into uh, drama triangles or victimhood when you could possibly be um, leaning more towards thrive? So it looks like uh, Taya said that she's ready. So Taya, as soon as you can send that, shoot that uh, picture to me so that I can uh, get that. So we can go over each line together and kind of give you an understanding of why we do it. And if she can um, let us know if it's a typical day or whether, because not everyone has the same sort of days. Correct. And then, as we were just saying, I do have a little bit of a homework assignment for people and it's going to call, we're going to call it story work. And it's writing a story about you, right? Who are the characters? What role did they play? What strengths and skills did you develop? What memories are worth utilizing and clearing and diffusing what isn't helpful? So this is part of timeline work. So once we tell the story, we can put this onto a timeline. And then once it's on a timeline, we can start to put numbers to it. And then we can start doing the clearing exercises that Mel's been discussing. And we can start doing the uh, step-by-step motions to getting us to a place where we can now fight through instead of having to, you know, be uh, stuck in this storyline. I call it the number 33 on a personal note. <laughs> and we'll get in that. There's a couple of uh, podcasts where you'll see that number 33 is how do you write your story? Fabulous. So we'll just use Taya's as an example for people so they can go and try it. Because like we've said, if we run a workshop and some space in the next webinar, um, we can go into one of those modules in right. depth. And I'm not receiving anything. So let's just keep pushing ahead and then we'll go ahead and um, backtrack to to this. So that way we can at least get uh, the, the rest of the information out that we um, need. So Taya could know in the chat um, how she felt at the first time point when she woke up and then she could give us the figures for plus whatever or minus whatever she could do it like that if we're having problem getting um... I got it so Melanie uh Mel will you I'm going to send this to you right now okay okay to your messenger that way you have her timeline brilliant okay let's have a look Now, I did want to point out that I highlighted on top of our chat, it's a pin chat, it's the drama triangle. This will really help you understand the the way your story looks and um, the way you're telling yourself that story. It helps you with how you fill in roles when we're still playing inside the game or the matrix or whatever you it is that you want to call it we all take on these different roles and it's our job to stay out of certain positions like the drama triangle. So I highly recommend looking that up, looking into it and then asking yourself questions about that. Yeah. And that's a whole separate. Yeah. That's an entire webinar webinar in itself. (laughs) Yeah. So thanks for this Taya. Um, of you writing that and it's great because um, I can tell that you've got the, the sense of it straight away. So what I notice is you've marked it minus three in terms of when you've, when you've either woke up or early in the morning and you're tired. Then you've marked it uh, the same at 11 and now you're hungry. So then plus five when you're being creative at three o'clock and plus eight when you're talking uh, with partner or friends and then it dips after um it dips minus four I think you were saying something about breaking and then some other emotions and what what's really interesting if you did this every day would it what the key emotions would be and whether or not the numbers would stay the same and it's a useful exercise to do so in terms of when you wake up um, people waking up tired and unmotivated it can be because of what you're thinking about before you go to sleep so you need to have really good sleep hygiene having a regular time when you go to sleep um, and writing down not any worries or thoughts and and rather not allowing yourself to procrastinate that's just at the top of my head that's quite a common no I agree with that that's exactly where I went with it too was if we're starting the day off in a, in yeah. a number 
make it a point that the goal is every night before we go to sleep to write down any of the things that are circling thoughts, write those down. It does magic. And then tell ourselves, and it's not overnight, but it's like any other thing we practice, tell ourselves, I'm going to sleep well. My subconscious is going to be peaceful. And when I wake up, I am going to wake up and then insert what it is that you want when you wake up and allow yourself that, that, that progression to happen. And what I'm thinking like two weeks max, and you'll start noting a real difference in how you're waking up every morning. And then that starts to shift the entire day. Yeah, that's very good advice. Um, And it's really just at this stage, it's really just noticing. And so mapping these out. Um, And then in terms of hunger, it could just be that you're the sort of person who needs to eat earlier. So being hungry affects your mood. Um, For some people, it might be that you need protein and and not carbs. It depends what you're doing. So it is worth thinking about whether or not you need to change something in your diet. Um, in terms of being creative that's great so it's like what aspects of being creative uh, takes it up to that and can you pepper that into the morning can you you know can you wake up and draw how you're feeling you know it could be that you use your creativity in a different way and then you're saying when you're talking to someone so talking and being creative increases your mental health and well-being then what decreases it um obviously you've highlighted that so feelings like disappointment if um there's something called a scale of consciousness and disappointment anger and shame all exist on the lower aspects of the scale so that's where it might be useful writing in your diary and is it a is it a common thing or is it just the it was that day that you felt like that so i think you've got the idea of this which is brilliant so it may be, I think in terms of if I, if we were working sort of separately, I'd be getting you to think about what you're doing before you go to bed, uh, as Danielle says, and then um, maybe putting some things in your environment that make you smile, make you feel happy, pictures around your mirror, or you go for a walk, do something that breaks that cycle that you're in in the morning. And it may be the five second rule. It may be that you stay longer in the shower and you do some rituals. It may be that you take, in a way, I I think you need to break uh, some habit that's going on there. And that's just a case of doing it, not waiting for motivation and just test it out. It may be that you do that for a week and you think, actually, that's the best advice I've had. Or you do it for a week and you think, it doesn't quite work, but I've seen an improvement. Because if you're not sleeping well and and you're not having the right REM sleep, um, and if you're worrying, procrastinate and you are falling into lower, lower emotions, that will have a massive impact. On it. And that is very classic and common in lots of people who come through our mental health services. Yeah. So hopefully that's been helpful. It's uh, an introduction. And if we were doing this in a group and we held up all of our pictures, they would all look different and we'd all different ways of perceiving those different events in the day but it just gives you an idea of how you can start to put on paper some of what's going on for you and when we do the next webinar or the workshop whatever you're a part of um we're going to go deeper into Mm -hmm. uh, that timeline as well as the other activities that you can start to introduce so before we finish today my aspect of this is Look at your well-being wheel. Choose one thing in each aspect, no matter how small, because even if it's really small, even if it's exercising for five minutes, you'll feel good feelings of having achieved it rather than the bad feelings of not having achieved it. And that's the whole point. Yeah, it is. And before we close this down and we're just going to go ahead and give a little bit of information Please know that Mel and I have done been doing podcasts for over a year and a half. A lot of the information that we're bringing forward today in this webinar is available to you on any of our podcasts. Uh, Mel, what is the um, what is the podcast? I know we're on YouTube. What is the other one that we're in? Uh, oh, Anchor. We're also in Anchor. So if you'd rather listen than to watch, that is totally fine. Both are yeah. available to you. We've done, I want to say 56 episodes so far. So there's a lot of information available. We even tap into tarot and how it affects the psyche and ways that we can deepen our understanding of psychology through tarot. 
So go ahead and set a few. Oh, also Mel and Danielle on Facebook. Please join our community. We are really trying to create this standard community that then branches off into communities that are based in the portion of healing on your journey that you're in. So the more that we have interaction, the more we'll feel ready to open up into new avenues that we can create these communities inside of the uh, Mel and Danielle 333 is our Instagram. Make sure you join us there. We're a little new to it. We're not doing a whole lot on there yet, but we are starting to bring in more of that process. And then anytime that you have questions or um, want to have more information that we can send you via links or names of podcasts, send us an email at Mel and Danielle or CC at gmail.com. And then outside of that, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, Just on the Facebook, if there's one, if they have one question about one of the things we've covered and we can answer that on Facebook, not questions about everything. So, um, you know, if they've done the wellbeing wheel and they have a question about that or how they can use it better or what they've noticed or something like that, and they're happy to do that, we can do that through the Facebook because we can put that model up that they have a question about and we can put some of the information about it, but it also helps other people and that sharing means that people don't feel alone and they're the only ones that are struggling with that issue. Right. Because you, as you all who have stuck through this, this beautiful webinar with us, amazing. I can say there's probably a consistency of, we have felt alone and nobody deserves to take this journey alone. We have communities that are being built every day for us to create together. (laughs) Therefore, nobody ever has to feel isolated on an island. There are times where isolation is necessary. We call that the hermit. We have to go within, but then we have information and questions and that's where the community comes in. So help us build this community and watch your journey soar in places you've never ever. It wasn't until I came across my tribe and and people that are coming into this journey that I felt the least alone that I'd ever felt in my entire life. So community is very important. And if you don't have a community, understand that a community of strangers can sometimes be the closest things to you. So now we're going to set some goals. And at the end of the goal, we're going to wrap this up. So, so because this has run a little longer than we expected, I'm not going to ask for a volunteer, but I am going to say that our Facebook is open for this volunteering and we will be responsive on it. This is part of the way that we can continue the free services without taking all of your time or all of our time. So some of the goals that we need to set, how am I going to move, right? How do I want to eat? How do I want to share my experience? What type of self-care am I doing? How much rest am I receiving? And by rest, I don't mean sleep. That's part of it. But how much am I resting? How much am I willing to explore? What is it I'm willing to research? What is calling me into research right now? And then my favorite is synchronicities. What things am I noticing that are aligning to what it is that I'm doing on this part of the journey. Some people use numbers. Some people use nature. Some people use conversations or words that are repeated. There's not a wrong way for there to be a sink. Allow the sink to come forward. Be open to paying attention to your world and allow that world to astound you. Give yourself 30 days. That's all we're asking. 30 days of mindfulness, of being consciously aware of the the whys and the hows, and you'll really see the significant change, the shift in your existence. And then if any of you will be open and move in forward and transparent about these activities or any of the things that we've brought, the modalities we've brought forward for you, and you would like to share this experience, we are going to be doing a giveaway where you get a free session with Mel and I, allowing um, the, the, the space to be provided a safe space for you to be provided with to really work through some of these deeper issues. So if you want that opportunity, take, take yourself seriously, take your motivation seriously and take your journey seriously and move ahead with it. You can send it again to the email, the Facebook messenger, anything that you feel comfortable with. 
So outside of that, we have some workshops that are coming up. So the first one is obviously this breaking, it's called break free from your cycle and master your destiny. Yeah. So this is really going to go more in depth into what it is we did an overview of. Now I'm going to be honest. Some of this stuff doesn't even appear because this is prep. A lot of what we've talked about is prep work to get you to the place where we're going. This is what we're calling psychology and spirituality 101. And we're taking you to the next level and the next workshop. We're going to be doing that in two parts because it is those initial steps are really, really big steps for you. And the more um, tools you have in your belt, the better it's going to be. We're going to be doing a workshop on exploring spirituality and As you can see, the things that we do go very much in depth. So it will not be a spirituality 101. We're going to go to the the, the shadow side of spirituality along with the light side of spirituality and everything in between. We're going to be doing a workshop over discerning truth, understanding mental health and well-being. And then the one I'm really excited about is how to truly forgive. Because forgiveness does not look like what we've read in the books or the poems or the speeches. It's a very personal journey, just like grief. So our, for our journey of forgiveness looks just like that, a journey up and down and around and around until you reach the finality of it. So outside of that, Mel, thank you for being you. Thank you for mastering your craft and sharing this with everybody. Oh, thank you for you being you and mastering your journey as well, Danielle. And absolutely just want to say one thing is the possibility that we have a, a part B to this workshop to explore one of these aspects because we've done the prep work and we gave a lot of information early on. And I'd really love to see what people took and did with that. If they can do the 30 days of anything. And within a week, start to notice that because you will build up new neural pathways. You will start to see changes and you might even see the magic occur because that is really possible in some of the things we're talking about. Um, I'm not sure when we're thinking of the next webinar that might be in, say, 30 days, the end of where are we now? Um, That might be the end of. Yeah, you're on the last day of July. So let's just we'll make a plan for the end of August. That will give you an adequate amount of time to put these processes in the action so that when you come back, you can see in action the work that's been done. And we will be here as a reminder that you started from one spot and you're here into the next. And that way you can congratulate yourself, give yourself that gold star and shine like the sun that you truly are. Yeah. And thank you everyone for coming on this journey with us. It was, you know, I didn't know it was in the, it it was going to come along in this year. (laughs) I know. (laughs) You know, and it's been a a nice platform for both Danielle and I to share what we're passionate about and some of the things that we've spent a lot of time, um, you know, uh, learning and discovering and be kind to yourself and, uh, have a think you've had a lot of information, let that digest and see what comes and use some of the tools we've given you. They're tools I've used in my life and we'll t- share more about our personal stories as we move forward. And you'll realize that actually, um, you know, we, we live in our truth in, in terms of the steps that we took. Yeah. Um, and just in terms practically, I think we'll be putting some time points because people might want to re-listen to how you do Correct. some of those steps. So we'll put time points at when we did the timeline, when we did the well-being wheel when we talked about Maslow. Um, I first have to figure out how to do that. That is a, there is something called chapters now that are available to you. So I will learn that. And then I will get that adjusted on our YouTube. Um, I have had it set up to where it can create chapters, but I'm really not sure beyond that. So bear with me as I'm learning technical things that you're doing amazing. Thank you very much. But guys, (laughs) Again, thank you so much for being a part of this journey with us. We really do appreciate it. And we look forward to seeing you soon.